Hal Elrod, my best friend in the entire world. You Brandon don't know that. Turner, I love you, dude. I actually, I, I, I tell you, I was uh, in the car talking to my good friend Jeremy, and mm. I was talking about the dinner that you put on mm. and how just phenomenal. I'm like, dude, it's it was at night. the most amazing house. He flew in his crew from Hawaii, the, all the chefs. Mm. They had stations at different parts of the property. I'm like, <laughs> it was unbelievable. I'm like, you know, and uh, he's like, that's cool. And I said, yeah. I said, he's like, I'm like, do you know Brandon? He's like, I know, I've heard of him. I go, yeah, I go, it's really interesting. I said, I think, I go, I like, I really admire Brandon. He's very successful. Handsome. I'm like, handsome. Um, Looks like a Viking. Like a, like a Viking. Like and a I said, Viking. I said, so it's interesting how, you know, I like, I, I, I said, I kind of hold Brandon on a pedestal. Mm. I'm like, but then I think he holds me on a pedestal. I I'm do. like, it's, yeah, I was like, yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. We're I like, like I just two men holding each other's pedestal. Okay. <laughs> That's right, dude. So weird. Anyway, I did not yeah. intend to, to start to, uh, to to completely take over no, the podcast. Can we do more of that? I yeah. like I like you talking about me. This is really fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Positive things about you, man. Yeah, it was really good. No, actually, that dinner was really special for me because my sister came. Mm. My sister Amber. Shout out to Amber wherever she's watching. And uh, she uh, was a big fan of yours. It changed a big part of her life. So she got to meet you. I remember that. Yeah, wow. she, it was a really special time for her. So it was a. Uh, it was very cool. So thank you for being awesome and yeah. for coming back uh, on. Well, this is the first time on this show. But yeah. This is probably the 40th time I've interviewed you. Yeah. But, uh, it's the second. Okay, but yeah. second. <laughs> same, but you, same in thing. your dreams, apparently, you... you <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. dreams. Yeah. <laughs> It's weird, man. <laughs> well, it's like you dream about what you like. It, like when you have a person's like cut out, like cardboard cut out on your mm. ceiling, you yeah. dream about them a lot. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah, that makes I sense. stole that from your event. Yeah. Uh, right, let's, I'm going to walk out. <laughs> <laughs> Let, okay, so right. I know you as, I mean, the world knows you as the Miracle Morning guy. Yeah. You wrote a book. Apparently some people bought it, yeah. uh, like a few million people. Uh, you have a movie about the Miracle Morning. What's it called? The Miracle Morning. Yeah. Shocking. Okay, uh, you've got... Uh, lots of books now. What dozen? Fourteen ish. Fourteen ish. You've got the app now. You've got like a, a huge, huge thing going. But take us back to a place you decide where mm. earlier in your life before you were Miracle Morning Hal. Yeah, that's a great. That's a great open ended way of putting it. Um, so I'll, you know, I'm going to start here. <clears throat> when I was eight years old, a uh, story I'm starting to tell more now because I'm realizing how relevant it is to my life. But I, it was like almost bl not blocked out, but I just, I didn't, didn't connect the dots. Um, <clears throat> when I was uh, seven years old, I had a six year old sister, uh, and I had a new sis a newborn sister that was just born Amory. And she was born with a really rare heart defect and she was a dwarf. So she mm -hmm. would never be over four feet tall. So she was in the hospital a lot, a lot of treatments and such. And a year and a half after she was born, um, my dad was at work. He worked at a grocery store. He was a manager. My sister, other sister, Haley, was at my grandma's house. And I woke up one morning. I was eight years old. And I heard my mother screaming, my baby, my baby. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up thinking, oh, my mom's, I thought she was playing. You know, I'm coming to. I'm kind of foggy. And then I start to sense panic, like desperation in her voice. And so I run across the hall to my parents' bedroom. And my mom has my 18-month-old sister laid out on the bed. And she's compressing her chest and breathing into her mouth and just tears <clears throat> running down her face. And uh, my sister died that morning of heart failure. And my parents were devastated, of course, you know. Um, at eight, I don't think I fully got it. In fact, it's an interesting, this is part of like doing therapy. I, this is where this came up, is uh, I, my sister went away in the, in the ambulance with my mom and dad that morning. And I assumed, oh, she, she'll be fine. Like, that's what they do. The ambulance is going to save her and we're good. So a friend, uh, my friend Ben, his mom came and picked me up and took me to her house uh, while my parents went to the hospital with Amory. And I got a call a few hours later and it was my dad and he was crying. I'd never heard him cry before. And he said, um, Hal, Amory's in heaven. And, uh, and I can't remember exactly what I was thinking or feeling. I just know what I said next. So I, I got off the phone with my dad and I went out into the living room. And I'm guessing that I, I didn't know how to pro like, you know, my brain, little eight year old brain's like, wait, like, I'm never gonna see her again? Like, what, what, what? You know, really weird. And um, I went in the living room and I go, I just smile, big smile. And, and I said, hey, you guys, guess where Amory is? And I think the mom knew. I rem like I have a vivid vision of her furrowing her brow and like tilting her head sad. And I said, Chris Emery is. And they said, and I said, she's in heaven. Isn't that great? Mm. Heaven's like the, supposed to be the best place ever. 
And I think that at that moment, a switch flipped, right? And it really, it, you know, if you know me and you know like how I responded to adversity throughout my life, I think I went, oh, I don't like the way I'm feeling. This is, I'm confused and I'm weird. And I can just focus on the positive and, and, and it, it feels better, yeah. right? And so, um, but the, the last part of that story is within a matter, like six months later, my parents turned their tragedy into a, a way to help other people. My mom was leading a support group for other parents who had lost children. So just six months later, she's mm-hmm. leading the support group for other parents that had lost children at, at a young age that had died. And then my dad's leading fundraisers to raise money for the hospital that cared for my sister while she was alive. And I realized it was looking back, I go, oh, I think that shaped everything that I do, which is like, you take your adversity and you 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 get through it and then you help other people with it. So yeah, that's fascinating, man. Yeah. You know, my, in a, I'm going to make this, I'm going to tell a story, but it's in comparison. It's, it's nothing. Wait, close are, to what you who's interviewing through. who, no. dude? <laughs> <laughs> so my, uh, my cat recently died. All right. So <laughs> like I said, I'm not trying to compare, right? <laughs> Different pedestal here. You poor, come uh, here. Yeah, come no. here, give me a hug. <laughs> my, my cat Sorry. passed away. We put her down. I brought her to the vet. We put okay. her down. But my six-year-old daughter, Rosie, when I told her I was taking her, you know, we're going to go put her down and, mm. that, that, you know, the cat was going to die. Um, I told Rosie, I was like, you know, hey, you know, the cat's not going to make it. Can't walk anymore. We got to go put her down. And she tears up and then she immediately says, well, can we get another one, a cute one? And it was like this really cute moment. But it was similar in that she didn't know how to process. Yeah. Because as she sat there, she's like, oh, okay, can we get another one, like a cute one? And it was an adorable statement. And then she starts crying after a few mm. minutes. Yeah. And yeah. So in a similar way, it's like kids don't, yeah, they, I don't think they can process that much heavy or grief or emotion. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it was fascinating. Well, what's weird is I didn't cry for my entire life. Mm. Like, uh, because, and because my belief was always like, no matter what happens, there's good in it. So I'm gonna find the good, I'm gonna focus on the good, and I'm gonna amplify the good, right? Um, and, uh, and it wasn't until, like my wife would, she's like, you're like a robot. Like, why can't you cry? And I'm mm. like, I, I don't know. Like, I want to cry. I yeah. literally don't know. And I literally didn't even know how to cry. And anyway, it ended up being like a really deep session of meditation where I like, I prayed about it and I like, and I had to imagine my children dying as morbid as that sounds. Wow. Like to try to get, and actually there's a really funny story. I was sleeping in the guest bedroom because I was going through, it was after chemo, after cancer, and I wasn't sleeping. So if my wife, she would always come in later and if she woke me up, I would be flooded with adrenaline, I wouldn't sleep. So we, I ended up moving into the guest bedroom just so uh, explaining why I was there. And so one morning, I woke up at like 3.30 in the morning, I'm, I'm meditating and my entire purpose was just to cry. Like to, to, I, I, I just mm. wanted to cry. And, uh, and, and so finally, after like imagining like losing my kids and what that would be like, I'm like, I need something to get me to cry. I finally start crying. And it's like 40 years or 30, whatever, I just am bawling. And I go, Ursula needs to see this. So it's four in the morning. That's your wife. My wife, yeah. Ursula, she needs to see this. I can, she thinks I can't cry. I'm crying. <laughs> I can cry. So dude, I go, she's never seen me cry in her life. We've been together for 18 years. I wake her up out of a dead sleep and I'm bawling. And she just goes fight or flight. And she's like, what's wrong? Where are the kids? What's wrong? I'm like, no, no, they're fine. Baby, I'm crying. I'm, she's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> so anyway. All right. So moral of the story is don't wake your wife up. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. If you have a breakthrough to share with your yeah. wife, wait until she wakes up. Don't shake her out of a dead sleep. But anyway, but it opened up the floodgates and then I couldn't stop crying for like months. I would Ooh. just start crying all the time. And then it became too much. She's like, you're a mess, dude. Yeah. I don't know what's <laughs> wrong with you. So yeah. Wow, man. I didn't know you couldn't cry. Yeah. And no, it's weird. Can. Are you, do you feel like you're normalized now? I mean, do, can you it's appropriately still, cry? It, it's hard because of my the way I interpret things. Like, there's very little. Like, it would have to be losing a child. You know, like, there's very little that to me is... But I want to cry. It's, it's still weird. So, no, it's still hard to cry. It's still... It's hard. I went... I, like, went back to not crying and... And so, yeah. but I do get, I can get, I mean, I actually got, I don't know if you told it, it was very slight, but I got choked up when I was telling Amory's story. Yeah. So, but that's usually about as far as it goes. Like to actually get a tear to run down my face and I don't, there's no pride in that. It's like, I actually yeah. wish it was easier for me to feel those emotions. So, yeah. Mm. 
Wow, man. You want to talk about that a little more? Yeah. <laughs> we got maybe. a little therapy session. Yeah, I need a little therapy. Yeah, we know we need to bring uh, Brooke Weinstein back. She, I interviewed her earlier today. She, uh, mm. she, she might have some answers. But I'm going to go to a more happy time. Yeah. Car accident. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but, uh, what, you know, because I, I know your story. So I don't want to like lead you all the way through your story yeah. here. Uh, yeah. But uh, let's talk about car accidents. Yeah. And I'll try to give the, the short version because I can get long-winded with this one. Um. So when I was uh, 19 years old, I started selling Cutco cutlery to lay the, the foundation here um, in my first 10 days. So, and important, I think, this is another piece I was in almost, I was almost going to start with this when you said, like, take us back. Yeah. That my whole life, I was very mediocre at everything I did. I think that's an important piece. Like, I didn't get good grades. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't popular. Um, and I say that because I think it's important. I think often we see people that are, you know, successful in whatever regard we would deem them successful. Um, we maybe assume that they've always been that way or like, and I know people like John, my friend, John Bergup, you know, John, yeah, I do. right. So John's one of those people that just, he, he's just good at, he always, he got great grades. He was the best golfer and right. Like yep. he's one of those people that's graded everything he's ever done. And he just kind of, what he touches turns to gold. And I hate, so I hate those people. I hate those people. <laughs> right. I, I literally, I say that all the time. Um, I tell John right to his face. Yeah, I, I hate, hate people <laughs> like you. Um, but, uh, we, uh, so when I started selling Cutco, it was my second day of training where I'm like, I found out about the, the all time record that had been broken. And I was like, why not me? Like if, if, and I think that's one of those, if you're listening to this right now, one of those important beliefs to embody is if another human being has done something, it doesn't mean they're better than you. It means they either learned or did something different than you. And if you learn what they learned and do what they did, you'll get very similar results. So in that second day of training, I was like, if this, the, the girl that had just broken the all time 50 year old company record happened to be like three weeks prior, like 30 minutes south of where I lived, right? So I was like, if she could do it, why not me? Yeah. So anyway, I go on, I break the record and, uh, and then a year and a half later, I'm giving a speech, teaching people how to, you know, do what I did or whatever. And driving home that night in a, I was in a Ford Mustang, a Chevy full size truck hit me head on at 80 miles an hour. Mm. Uh, it sent my car spinning into oncoming traffic, which was actually the worst was yet to come. Like the head on, airbag protected me. I'm not sure what injuries may or may not have happened, but I spun around and the car behind me T-boned me at 70 miles an hour. And I immediately, you know, if you can imagine getting hit in your driver's side door at 70, right? I, the whole door crushed the left side of my body and I broke 11 bones. I broke my femur, my leg broke in half, my, my pelvis broke in three places, my arm broke in two pieces, shattered my elbow, shattered three bones around my eye. Um, doctors thought I'd be blind in that eye. My ear was almost completely severed. The top of the ceiling buckled and it sliced a big V into the top of my head. And I was immediately in a coma. Thank God. I, you know, couldn't withstand the pain and the, thank God our body has that mechanism. Uh, and then uh, it took an hour to pull me out of the car. I bled so much that I bled out and I was clinically dead when they pulled me out of the car. I had, my heart had stopped beating, wasn't, obviously wasn't breathing. Uh, and according to police reports or, or paramedic reports, whatever, I was dead for approximately six minutes. And then they put me on a helicopter, used the, you know, the electricity, what's that called? Defibrillators, um, shot me back to life. And uh, I spent the next six days in a coma flatlined twice more, which my poor parents, they'd lost their youngest. Now they're laying, you know, at my bedside, looking at me hooked up to ventilator or hooked up to, you know, life support. Right. And, um, and then I'm flatlining, like they're getting cleared out of the room. Oh, he's, he's dying again. Like, right. You know, mom and dad, I feel so they had it harder than me, but I came out of the coma six days later and they said I would never walk again. I had permanent brain damage. I have metal rods through my arm, my leg on and on. And within a few days, uh, actually, it was a week after I came out of the coma. The doctors called my parents in and they said, we're concerned with Hal. We believe he's in denial because he's always smiling and laughing and joking. And that's not normal for a, a young person or any person that has had this happen. And so my dad came in and he told me the doctor's concerns. And I shared with him one of the most important lessons I've ever learned in my life. I said, dad, remember, I live my life by the five minute rule. He said, remind me what that means. And I said, I learned it in my Cutco training. It states that when something goes wrong in life, it's okay to be negative, to get angry, upset, like feel your emotions, but there's no value in dwelling on something that is now out of your control. It's in the past. You can't change it. And a lot of people are suffering over things that happened not five minutes ago, but five decades ago, yeah. right? It's not happening anymore. It's our thoughts about it that's happening. And so 
we were taught that you set your timer for five minutes and when the timer goes off, you say three words, can't change it. Powerful words, it's an acknowledgement. I always accompany it with a deep breath, can't change it. I can't change what happened five minutes ago. So I can either sit here and continue to be miserable and angry and upset and frustrated and pissed, right? But is that serving me? Usually, no. Or I can choose to be comp- accepted exactly as it is, accept my life and what happened five minutes ago. This is my new reality and I get to choose how I deal with it. And I can either be miserable or I can be at peace and move forward. And I said, dad, I can't change that I was in a car accident. I broke 11 bones and I'm doctor still never walk again, but I can choose to be the happiest, most grateful person I've ever been while I endure the most difficult time in my life. And for anybody watching or listening, like consider that, that the most difficult time in your life, let alone inconveniences or arguments with your spouse or, you know, financial challenges. I mean, right. We've been through it all. Um, you can choose. It's, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. You can go through difficult times. And to me, the more difficult the time, the greater the opportunity to develop, to develop my ability to be at peace with reality exactly as it is. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Do you remember anything from the coma time or about like, do you remember any of that? No, no, there's two months or sorry, two weeks of my life that I have zero memory. It's it, my yeah. last memory is like getting on the freeway that night. And then my first memory is basically that conversation that I just shared that I had with my dad. And even yeah. that's fuzzy. It's actually interesting. It's, it's very, I don't know where real memories begin and stories that my mom and dad and sister sure. and friends have told me from that time. I, I really, it's very hard for me to know when I actually started to remember again. Yeah, memory is a funny thing anyway. You know, have you ever listened to that podcast? Um, Who's the guy that wrote like the tipping point? Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. So he's got a podcast on uh, memory. Uh, One of his, his, I can't remember. One of his episodes? Yeah, one of his episodes. Yeah, one of his episodes is on on memory. I can't remember the name of the the even show, but Malcolm Gladwell has a show, Revisionist History, I think is what it's called. Anyway, and it's on uh, Brian Williams, the guy from like NBC who said he was like in a helicopter getting shot at in Iraq and then it comes out later that he really wasn't. And it's all people like, he's a liar. And so the whole episode, like an hour long thing, was probably the most fascinating podcast I've ever listened to. It's all about how our memories are sliced in with uh, images from TV, news, and other people's stories. Hmm. And so it's almost like if, you're, if your mind is a, you know, one of those old-fashioned projectors that <clears throat> has all the slides, we just remove slides and put new slides in all the time. And they did a study, and I don't remember the exact percentage. It was basically like the majority of what people remembered 10 years later about 9-11 was not true. And they huh. did this study based on like people's journaling, people who journaled that day and then didn't look at the journal afterwards. Yeah. But like they wrote very detailed what happened that day. And then they asked them 10 years later to recount what happened uh, to them that day. Yeah. And over 50% of their memories were, were wrong about their own experience. Right. Yeah. And so it, may, it makes me question. It's just funny that you brought that up is like almost everything. Now I think about my t- past, like I will swear all day up and uh, you know, up and down, like that happened to me. I remember yeah, it. Yeah, I know yeah. it was true. <laughs> but was it? Yeah. Uh, well, if you're we married, you will find out that your <laughs> memories are not yes. accurate. <laughs> you're all, that's exactly it, right. How many times me and my wife will have a discussion and be like, honey, I, I'm a hundred percent sure that's not the yeah. way that happened. Yeah. And she's like, you're a moron. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent sure that is the way well, it happened. And, and see for me, my, my wife uses the brain. She's like, you have brain damage. I'm yeah. like, no, 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 no. But I know this. I, re- I don't remember a lot, yeah, but I remember, I remember what I remember. Like I can't yep. win. Like yeah. it's just, you know. All right. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, memory is a funny thing. Uh, yeah. All right, so we move from that car accident. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about cancer in a little bit. Let's go yeah. middle miracle morning or the Let, yeah. Let's go financial wife. crash. Let's go wife, wife, wife. Where'd you, where'd you meet your wife? I never get to talk about. Yeah, this. tell this me about your wife. I love your wife. So yeah. tell me about your wife. Uh, Urs- Ursula is her name, uh, and she doesn't like me talking about her too much. So I'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be careful what I share. She, it's funny because I I have my own podcast and she's yeah. in the kitchen and she's like, don't tell me. She's like comes yeah. in. She, <laughs> talk about that you know because i have i'm open kimono dude all day I'm like what our sex it's our sex life everybody yeah, has sex right yeah. She's like, don't talk about yeah. it <laughs> let's um, talk about your sex life Hal. yeah okay well right. no. yeah so um the yeah i do know some of the lines that i shouldn't cross um <laughs> no so <laughs> ursula and i so i was on a dating app uh not tinder uh, that wasn't around back then it was it was actually yahoo personals mm. yahoo had their own personal website and i was renting a room from my buddy matt matt recor shout out to matt and uh, one of my best friends and he um uh he he brought home a date one night and she was just she was beautiful and i was single you know and i go i go where did you meet her he goes oh this this website i'm on yahoo personals and i was like 
what I, I it, cause back then internet dating was really taboo. Yeah. I was like, wait, there's like beautiful and she was really sweet and I was like, there's women like that. I was like, I, I thought it was like, you know, I don't know what I thought. <laughs> and uh, so I set up a profile, right? And then uh, probably a few weeks into it, you know, I had gone on a couple of dates and, and then Ursula, my wife, messages me. And the funny part is her picture was terrible. It was like super far away, yep. like not like not that she looked terrible, but I couldn't I couldn't tell yeah. if it was her, right? So when you're on those sites, all you can really you know you read the description, but you're looking at the pictures and going, oh, she I'm attracted to this person, so I like really didn't pursue her that much, and she pursued me, and she was moving from San Diego to Sacramento, and then and then once I saw her in person, I was like fell, I was like oh my gosh, and then we were just inseparable and. That's you know, great. the rest is kind of uh, history. And hey, we dated for five years until she gave me the ultimatum. She's like, Ooh. either we get married or I'm done. Then I'm like, yeah. all right, we're getting married. What are the top three things you love about your wife? Um, she uh, is as loyal as anyone, like as a friend, as a wife, as a, she's just so loyal. Like, it's interesting. So, and, and this creates a huge conflict for us. Um, I am loyal to values, I'm most loyal to values, to what I believe is right. And she is loyal to people. So it's very interesting. So mm. if she does or says something that I feel like wasn't her best moment and violates what I believe is right, you know, I will defend the value. Or if somebody hurts her, if somebody says something and is offending or whatever, I'm all, and I'm, look, I'm always looking for the best in people. I'm trying to understand why maybe they were hurt as a child. And that's why, you know, so she can't stand you know, like, right, So, so we totally butt heads. So I, but I think at the end of the day, she really does value that I adhere to my value. Just not when they conflict with what she's, you know, upset about. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, so she's extremely loyal. She's so hard, like hardworking and motivated. And what's interesting is um, I used to think that I wanted someone that was like me. So when I was in Cutco, I would see the other top, you know, female sales reps and be like, ooh, I'm attracted to that. She's kicking butt. She's like me, right? And I thought that, that I wanted somebody like me in business. And what I ended up realizing was it's the qualities of someone who is motivated and disciplined. But my wife stays home with the kids. We have two kids. And I realized, oh, I don't want, if my wife was like me, then the house would be neglected or we'd have to pay people to take care of it or right. The kids would not be being raised by one of us, you know? And so, yeah, so I love how motivated she is, but she applies it to our family and to our household. And so it was interesting. And I, I've, I've actually, when I used to coach, do like one-on-one -on -one coaching, I would actually share that with a lot of my clients that were looking for, you know, their future wife. I'd go, Hey, keep this in mind. You know what you think you want, you might just want the qualities, but you might want her to apply them to mm. different things that's good um and then and she's supportive she's so supportive like she is uh you know she's our rock man she she's supportive of me and and my goals and dreams and you know and a lot of times that you know means that she has to really make sacrifices but great example i'm supposed to be taking our daughter to dance class mm. i do it every wednesday and i said hey sweetie i want to let you know there's this opportunity that came up i'm gonna let you decide um, and, uh, and she's like, she loves you by the way. <laughs> and she was like, no, brand is awesome. She's like, I'll take care of it. I'll get the kids from school. I'll take Sophie to dance. You go do the podcast with Brandon. So just an example of her putting my, you know, needs first. And, uh, but yeah, it was uh, another, and, but she loves you too, which I think if it was somebody else, she might've been like, no, you do podcasts all the time. So more kudos to Brandon Turner. The dinner was worth it just for that right yeah, there. Totally. Yeah. That's why I did that dinner. So yeah. I knew that someday I'd you cash knew you'd in be able my, to cash in my favor. Yeah. I got my <laughs> favorite. I'll tell her I said, thank you. Yeah. Uh, how that do dinner you, probably probably earned you. I think you got more. I think you okay. got like, like you got like 10 in the bank. Okay, dude. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We'll just podcast again every week for a yeah, while. Every Wednesday. Go. All right. Uh, let, how do you balance with your wife this and maybe you don't have to balance it, but I, I'm kind of projecting because I, I have this sometimes. I am super like outgoing and ambitious and I like business and I like traveling and speaking sometimes. Yeah. And I like, I like the whole thing. Yeah. My wife would rather have me at home with the kids playing or going to the beach. Like, fam like family is like, her ideal. And she's, again, very supportive of, uh, mm. supportive of me. But she also would just rather have. Would so for rather her, be it's there. an internal conflict. It's being supportive, but she'd yeah. rather have you there. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you face any of that? Like when you go and travel, like is she, like do you ever have any conflict there? Um, no. So I, it's interesting. The it, and it depends if it's too for sure. If it's too much, like sure. I've had times where I'm I'm writing a book or getting doing a book launch, and you know where oh this just happened recently where uh, I was to the very I was toward the end of my manuscript, 
Um, and then it was like down to the, you know, I had, I had four weeks left and I was like, sweetie, the pace I'm on, I'm going to need to work weekends, you know, and I haven't done that. And it's been a long time since I worked weekends like that. She's like, okay. And actually I think it was me. I thought it was me. I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to need this weekend. And then that weekend ends and I'm nowhere near, I'm like, yeah. I'm going to need next weekend. And that ended up going on for four weekends. So she, you know, by the fourth weekend, she's like, okay. It's like, and then after that, you know, and then it comes, and then it comes back where she's like, I just gave you four weekends. Yeah. Like, no, you can't do that. Like I, you know, and I'm like, all right. So, but, but overall, I think she actually likes breaks from me. Mm. Um, and that may be for many reasons. I think one, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm an optimizer. I optimize everything, including everything that we do as a family. And she's a lot more just chill and like, dude, just, I want to eat the, I want to eat this crappy food right now. And for me, I'm literally impeccably optimizing. I'm like, I will not put anything in my body for the most part that is not like, you know, and so I'm that way with the kids, with her. And there was a time where it actually got really, when I had cancer and I think I was trying to control things even like more and it became a major issue. So now I'm much more chill. Um, but I think she, I think she really does like, I think it is almost like, um, yeah, I think it's, she's like, oh, he goes out of town and I can just, I don't have to worry that he's going to like try to make sure we're eating perfectly all the time. So yeah. yeah. I get, that makes a lot of sense. What about just marriage in general? And I know we'll get to Miracle Morning stuff. I'm, I'm teasing that's the good. audience. They know like it's coming, it. right? Because oh, yeah. I know every interview you do, you just sit there and tell, talk about Miracle Morning, no, which people yeah. want to hear, but I want to know about, you have, a, you have a strong marriage, at least from the outside, it looks a very strong marriage. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people listening to this maybe don't have a strong marriage and they're struggling. No. Uh, what advice do you have people? What has worked for you to give you a better marriage? First, I just want to say that we've, we've been on the brink of divorce. Uh, and I don't that's, that's a strong statement, sure. but I, I've definitely considered it. And so is she, yeah. right? Like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Yeah. Um, in fact, she, yeah, she told me recently, she probably wouldn't like me sharing this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm actually going to, I'm going to start. Well, uh, she, she really considered it. Well, I'll just sure, say that yeah. at one point, she really considered it uh, when, when, like, when it was really hard. Um, so I just want to say that, like, it's not all roses and, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it's definitely been really challenging at times. I'll tell you what was the game changer for me. And actually I just spoke at a front row dad's event yep. and this was the, crux of my message at the event. Um, in 2016, we moved from California to uh, Texas. And we came out, looked at houses, didn't find anything we liked, had a second trip scheduled. And she couldn't, for whatever reason, at the last minute, she had to stay back. And I came by myself. But we had to, we had sold our house. We had to find a house. So she had to, I had to find it sight unseen, which never a good idea. And, uh, and so I find this house. I love it. I FaceTime her or whatever. She's like, looks great. I trust you. Get it. I get it. And then we, we fly into the house and we have to take separate flights for some reason. She flies in with the kids, drives to the new house. I actually go to the car dealership because I had left my car in California, turned in the lease, had a new car waiting for me here. I get a call from her. We're, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're at the dealership or I'm at the dealership and I go, Oh, hold on. My wife's calling. She's seeing our house for the first time. This is going to be great. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. And she's like, I do not like it at all. And I go, yeah, right. Isn't it amazing? She's like, I'm not joking. And I just am like, hmm. I don't know what to, I just bought a house for us and she doesn't like it. And I'm like, why don't you, and she starts naming off all the things she doesn't like. She's like, I'm sorry, but I don't, I'm just being honest. Like, I'm like, oh, I, I, I can't talk to you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm signing paperwork. I, I love you. I'll call you in a little bit. And Ooh. so, um, that created, that was the, the start of like that summer. And I was working a lot. I think we were already really a stressful place. Now she's living in an, an environment that she doesn't like. And I, that, so a lot of conflict. So our marriage started to really spiral into a really bad place. Um, and uh, within a couple of months, she, we're supposed to go on a camping trip and we get in this huge blowout fight. And, uh, and I'm like, I don't remember, I, I think it was me that decided, I'm like, I'm not going. I'm like, I'm not going. I'm like, I'm, just, I'm not going. I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to be around you, whatever. So I decided not to go on the camping trip. And part of me, and by the way, this is how messed up my priorities were. I'm like, great, I can work, mm. right? Like my kids were little, dude. I should, like now, I, in hindsight, I would have never missed that camping trip. And I would never, right now. But then I was a workaholic, uh, I didn't, uh, undiagnosed, didn't realize it. It was all for the family, story we all tell ourselves, all yeah. of us entrepreneurs. Um, and, uh, but I realized our kids aren't gonna remember how many mortgage payments we made or how many books we sold or how many speeches we gave, right? And so 
They leave, and while she's gone, I read this article by Brian Reeves called Choose Her Every Day. Have you heard this? Mm-hmm. By the book. He just came out with a book. Um, I, read the, I read this article, and he basically, it, it, it makes me realize that my wife is not my priority, and that I, I have one foot out the door, and I'm, I'm not fully committed. And then this was the real breakthrough that it led to that transformed my marriage and that I would say this is the real answer. I always take forever to get the answer. (laughs) This is the answer. Um, I realized that I was in what I call a reciprocal relationship, meaning I reciprocated her energy, her mood, her, the way she treated me. And I think we all do this, right? It's very normal. If someone is nice to you, your spouse or a stranger, right? You naturally feel inclined to reciprocate that niceness, that kindness, whatever. If someone is rude to you, your spouse or anyone, you feel very justified and it's very natural to reciprocate that energy. And I realize this is, this is not a winning formula, not a winning strategy. We have ups and downs because it's reciprocal. And if she's having a, in a bad mood, right, that's not even about me, but she's going to naturally, uh, you know, come from that place of I'm, she's angry. So it's not about me, but, but I'm going to take it personally. And then I'm going to come right back at her. So I had the epiphany. I went, what if I just in writing, and this was, became my miracle morning. I go, what if I write, I clarify in writing who I'm committed to being as a husband, like the values, the behaviors, the attitude, the mindset, and even, and especially when she comes at me with anger or she puts me down or whatever it is, how will I respond? Who am I committed to being? Not just when things are easy and great. Who am I committed to being when she is, in my mind, coming at me in a way that I think is unfair, uncalled for, inappropriate, upsetting, right? And so I went, I'm going to be not the perfect husband, but like, I'm just committed. This is the husband I'm going to be. And there's nothing that she can do or say to change it. Like that was my aspiration. And I go, theoretically, that should transform our relationship because she's in a reciprocal relationship like 99% of human beings are. So if I consistently, for the rest of this year, it was like June at that time, like for the next six months, I'm gonna try this strategy where every morning during my miracle morning, I'm gonna read these affirmations that affirm the husband I'm committed to being, why I'm committed to that, and what specific actions, words, freight, what I will do to be that. And she came home. Oh, and, oh, and here's what I did. I go, I need a big, like, I need a big act. Not where I say, this is what I'm going to do. Cause I didn't want, I wanted to show her. I didn't want to put, you know, cause she had me say things before and not follow through. So I made what, so I asked myself, what are all of her fears and insecurities in our relationship? And I created this thing on like Shutterfly or whatever called my forever pledge. And it was to Ursula, my wife for life, from Hal, your husband till the end. And I address, she's a child of divorce, so she's got, you know, fears and things. And I addressed all of her concerns, uh, right? It'd be like in sales, handling the objections. And I, I, I affirmed my commitment to her, no matter what, there was nothing she could do to change who I was going to be for her. And I printed it on this beautiful 11 by 14 inch or 14 by 18 inch, really big, uh, white framed, bordered with hearts, like beautiful font. I had it overnighted and I hung it on her wall next to her bed so that she would see it first thing in the morning and last thing before bed. And so when she came home, we had come off this huge conflict and I, I knew that, you know, and I wanted like, I go, hey, sweetie, I just want you to know I'm so sorry for how I've treated you and everything I've done. And this is how I'm committed to showing up for you. And you can count on this. I signed it, you know, and um, that transformed our marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I didn't tell her about the affirmations part or that. I, I just wanted to show her that. But me showing up that way, it was reciprocal and she would get triggered just like she always, right? But I wouldn't react. And I wasn't perfect, but I would do my best not to react. And if I reacted, I would quickly catch myself and go, I'm sorry, I just took that personally. It's not about me. How can I serve you better? How can I be a better husband for you? And that was the secret to transforming our marriage. And to this day, it's that. And, and eventually I confessed to her what I had done. And then she started, like now, she, now we both approach it that way. And the last thing I'll say on that is I was diagnosed with cancer like three months later. And thank God, I don't know that our marriage would have made it to the cancer had I not had that epiphany and made that commitment to how I was going to show up for her. 
before, you know, before I was diagnosed. Wow. You know, the best piece of marriage advice I ever got, it was before I got married, some uh, old guy told uh, my wife and I, he said, you know, most marriages are 50-50. Mm-hmm. Meaning you, have, you give 50, you go 50, we're going to meet in the middle, we're going to have a great marriage. Yep. But the problem with that is if somebody's not operating perfectly, you're now at 49 yeah. or 48 or 47. And maybe I can push forward a little bit, but I'm only supposed to do 50. Yeah. And if you're lacking, we, it, every marriage then has a gap. Yep. And he said... Don't operate 50-50, operate 100%. Yeah. You can, they can do whatever they want. You operate 100% because That's you it. have a perfect marriage no matter what. And then the law of reciprocity, which says when you do something good for people, they naturally want to do it back and give back to you. Like when I invited you to a nice dinner and now your wife let you come out here, right? <laughs> That's right. Law of reciprocity. <laughs> Same thing. Like it, it, it applies in business. It implies in life. It implies, it applies in marriage. Yeah. And so all of a sudden then, like the more I, now I'm, I'm not perfect either at it, but the more I can say, it doesn't matter what you do. Like I'm going to Jocko Willink this thing and extreme ownership it. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to have a hundred percent marriage. And, and as a result, yeah, anytime there is a problem, it's usually because I'm not doing a hundred percent. Yeah. And if we can stick with that. So, all right. You just said in two minutes what it took me 10, man. I need your coaching on, uh, on how to speak in sound bites. What you do is you listen to somebody else talk for, for yeah, and five minutes, you're... and then you just, yeah, I think, how do I summarize this up uh, for a social media clip so I can go viral with it? Mm. Um, <laughs> Genius. No, actually, I do have, a, we have an idea on the show, uh, or me and Alex have been talking about, and I'm going to test it on you right now. Yeah. So we may not even air this segment on the podcast, but can you summarize the story you just told about your wife in a one minute clip that we throw that you can put on your social media later. That is about so marriage. interesting. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's yeah. your best, what's your best marriage advice? Yeah. The way that I transformed my marriage, it was during the most difficult time in our marriage where we were on the brink of divorce and I had a breakthrough and I realized that I was in a reciprocal relationship, which meant that I was mirroring her energy. If she was upset and angry, I mirrored that back. If she was happy and I mirrored that back. And I realized that's a losing strategy because it's always this roller coaster ride of happy marriage, unhappy marriage, happy marriage, unhappy marriage. My breakthrough was when I went, I'm just going to, in writing, articulate and affirm who am I committed to being as a husband? How am I committed to showing up for my wife no matter how she shows up, no matter how she treats me? It's an unconditional commitment. And I started immediately without telling her every morning during my miracle morning, I would affirm it. And I would show up that way. And I wasn't perfect, but I was, I, I mean, I was able to quickly shift that energy if I, got, if I got out of line. And within a matter of months, the reciprocal relationship continued, but in the positive, because now she started to reciprocate the way that I was showing up for her. And then we started to show up at 100% for each other. I love it, man. Wasn't that good, right? <laughs> that was a good idea, right? We, we, we pull a moment from the podcast that's and we brilliant. make it for a social yeah, clip. Yeah. Genius. Like that clip is going to be a great social media clip. All right. Uh, uh, all right. I love it. We're getting back to it. All right. So you mentioned Miracle Morning. So we probably should. Uh, what is should, Morning Miracle? It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a really great book, man. You should read it. <laughs> uh, the Miracle Morning was a book that made a big impact on my life as well. I read it years and years ago, back probably close to the time. I mean, I, I think I read it pretty early. Uh, and I was a guy that I hate waking up early. I do not wake up early. I don't, I mean, that's what I would say. I don't yeah. like waking up early. Uh, and that just changed a lot for me. And so can you explain how did you get from, you know, Hal, yo pal, Hal, right. To, yeah. um, miracle morning, Hal. Yeah. Uh, so 2008, the U S economy crashed and a tough year. Yeah. Were you around yeah. in that time? Yeah. yeah it wasn't I, just me. Yeah. No, I was there. I was, yeah. uh, I was buying real estate though. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> I speak at a lot of real estate events and I'm like, how many were there during that? How many yeah. of you suffered those effects? But, yeah. Um, and so I had just bought my first new house mm. and, uh, you know, at the top of the market and usually uh, good strategy actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then that crashed and uh, I crashed with the economy like millions of, you know, of yep. people did. And I lost over half of my coaching clients. That's how I made all my income. And uh, was I was a you know sale, coach sales people and entrepreneurs. Lost over half my clients. Lost over half my income. Lived on credit cards. Lost my house. Could not pay my mortgage. Mm. You know, and and it's like when you you know when you you're living the dream, right? You bought the house. I'm engaged to be married. You know, we're planning a family. I mean, all of it. And then I can't pay the bills. I'm living in fear. I, I canceled my gym membership. I'm I'm eating terribly. My habits fell off. I was a mess. And literally, financially, physically, mentally, emotionally, I was at the lowest point in my life. And uh, a buddy of mine, John Berghoff, who I mentioned him earlier, uh, he recommended I listen to this Jim Rohn audio. And I don't remember the name of it. It was probably your best year ever. I, I don't remember the name of it. But he said it was a life changer, for, game changer for him. 
and it changed my life. It was the it was the it was the catalyst for the miracle morning, if you will. It was one quote, and Jim Rohn said, "Your level of success, and I believe it's in all areas of life, right? But your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development." And when I heard that. I had probably heard it before, but it clicked and I went, I quantified it and I went, okay, wait a minute. So if we're measuring success, however you define it, fulfillment, you know, freedom, however you define it. If you're measuring success in any of your area of your life on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best, it is safe to say that human beings aspire toward a 10, right? We want life to be as good as it can be, as happy and healthy and our relationships to be as harmonious and we want to experience as much love and freedom. And like, you know, nobody is like, I don't want to be too happy or too healthy. I'll settle for like a six. Like, no, we all want, we all aspire toward this level 10. But as Jim Rohn said, your level of success, level 10 is what we want, will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I asked myself, what's my level of personal development? And at that time I was in, desperation mode. I would sleep till the last minute. I would sit in front of my computer till nine at night till my eyes were like, couldn't look at the screen anymore. I would eat something, watch TV and go to bed and rinse and repeat. And I realized my level of personal development is like at a two or a three. And I thought that's the disconnect. And I, it hits me that that's the disconnect for most of society. We all want this level 10 you know, definition of success, whatever that is, but our level of personal development, if it's at a two or a three or a four or five, the disconnect is we're not dedicating time each day to becoming the person that we need to be that is capable of creating the success that we want. We're staying relatively the same and wondering why our results aren't getting better. And I had the epiphany. I went, okay, I'm going to go home and I'm going to, I'm going to go figure out what are the world's most successful people do for their personal development. I'm going to do that. And it's like I said earlier, the most important belief, one of the most important beliefs you can have is do what other people do. Right. And, 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 and model their mindset and their actions and you'll get similar results. And so I did a Google search and it spent like 30 minutes and I looked for the number one, what was the most effective practice? And I ended up with a list of six. It was meditation, affirmations, visualization, exercise, reading, and journaling. And I went, which is the best one? And there was no clear cut answer. The world's most successful people for centuries have attributed their success to one of these practices. For example, I saw an article, Fortune 500 CEOs who swear by meditation. And that was a paradigm shift because I go, I've always thought of meditation like monks getting closer to God. I never thought of CEOs that were attributing their greatest ideas and clarity that led to huge financial windfalls. I'm like, hmm, I guess I got to start meditating, right? And it went on down the line with these six practices. And I go, oh, I don't know which one to do. And then the epiphany was, what if I did all of these? Mm. And I woke up the next morning. I did all six practices poorly. I, like, I didn't know how to meditate. My mind was racing. Affirmations felt super inauthentic the way I learned them. Visualization, like it, it didn't, it all felt kind of funky. But even doing it relatively mediocre, it was like more of a mediocre morning that first day, I felt like this is it. If I start every day with this much clarity and energy and motivation and I'm learning something new, it's only a matter of time before I become the person that I need to be to create and sustain the success that I want in my life. And I was thinking like, you know, 1% better every day, like a year from now, it can be totally different. My life can be different. It happened so fast. In less than two months, I more than doubled my income. And I want to highlight, Brandon, that was in the 2008 recession. Like at, 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 It was getting worse and worse and worse, and I doubled my income. And I, I want to highlight that because we're in that time again right now. Yeah. And I want you to realize that you are not at the mercy of the recession. You're in charge, right? Even though it was harder to get coaching clients, there were still people out there that wanted coaching, Right? And I figured it out. In two months, I more than doubled my client load, right? I found those people. And so I went to my wife. The last part of the story is I said, sweetheart, we, I just signed on two new coaching clients. It's in less than two months because of this morning routine, literally, because I'm reading a book on getting coaching clients. I'm affirming that I can do it. I'm visualizing it every day. I said, we've more than doubled our income. It feels like a freaking miracle. She goes, it's your miracle morning. And I go, Yeah, I like that. Miracle morning. And so I wrote it down. I never thought it'd be a book, but then I started teaching it to my coaching clients and one by one after another, they went, I'm not a morning person, Hal. I go, no, no, neither was I. Here's five. I I have five little tips on how to beat the snooze button. 
And 13 out of 14 of my coaching clients came back to the next call and they go, Hal, I'm, 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 Miracle Morning's changing my life. I'm, I'm selling more. I'm, I'm in better shape. I'm reading again. I'm on and on and on. And that's when the light bulb went off and I went, if this changed my life and I wasn't a morning person and it changed 13 out of 14 of my coaching clients' lives and none of them were morning people, like two were, this, the world needs this. And then that's when I committed, I'm going to write a book. And, you know, it took three years. I'm a slow writer and, you know, <laughs> self-published. And now, you know, the rest is kind of history, as they say. Wow. All right. So I can't let you off without explaining the five tips to beat the snooze. Mm. What, how do Ooh, we do yeah. that? We, we hardly ever talk about that. Brandon, you're so good. Um, <laughs> so uh, I should only give like three and a half. And oh, then you have to make him read the book. No, I'll give all yeah. five. You don't care. <laughs> um, so uh, number one is set your intention before bed. And this is actually sounds like a soft, you know, like a softy. Dude, it's so crucial. Think about this. Your first thought in the morning is almost always the last thought you had before bed. And, that, and even maybe more, more accurately, your mental and emotional state in the morning is whatever mental and emotional state you dwelled in before bed. In fact, yep. I'm writing um, uh, The Miracle Evening right now. And, uh, and that's, that's, it's essentially like, that, that's a big crux, a big part of it. So if you go to bed feeling stressed and overwhelmed and thinking about all the millions of things you gotta get done, first of all, it's harder to fall asleep. Your quality of sleep is usually poor, right? You might have some nightmares, but then you wake up in that state and you're like, oh God, I got to face it all over again. And here's what made me realize that is I went, when I was a kid, wait, there was no time better than Christmas morning Dude, to I wake just wrote, up. Dude, I just wrote down Christmas morning. Because <laughs> <laughs> right? that's you, what I thought of, Christmas yeah, right? morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, and so, you're, never, and, you're never tired on Christmas morning. Yeah, I, that's it. are you ever tired? It doesn't matter what time you go to bed, yep. how many hours you go to sleep, if you have terrible quality of sleep. And I realized, and I just, I, I went, why can't I recreate that experience every morning? And then I, de I reverse engineered it. Why am I excited with Christmas morning? Because when I go to bed, I have an intention. I might not set it consciously, but there's an intention that I am going to wake up. I'm going to run in the living room. I'm going to look at the presents. It's going to be the greatest thing. I'm so excited. And I thought, why don't I have that intention and that mindset every single night when I go to bed? So I wrote out these affirmations. I call them my bedtime affirmations. And if you get the Miracle Morning book, they're one of the bonuses in there. Um, but the, the bedtime affirmations, it was like word for word that I would tell myself, no matter how many hours of sleep I'm getting, whether I wake up or I don't or how, whatever, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to jump out of bed. I'm going to have so much energy and excitement for the morning. I'm going to generate that. It's not dependent on something out of my control. I'm in control. So that's number one. Set an but, empowering intention. By bed. the way, I'll let you continue with the other four. Yeah. But I just want, like, when I read The Miracle Morning, I, I read that part and I laughed. I mean, where you talked about just waking up early and how like you'd want to. Or to and I'm like, there is no chance that works. There's just none. And then like the first day I did it, I was like, I'm so happy to be up right now. And it, it worked exactly yeah. as you said. So I just wanted to give some credibility yeah. there. It was, it was amazing. Well, and I, when I, will say, I will say this. If anybody is listening that like you that is a, can, does not consider themselves a morning person, join the club. Uh, we, we survey the Miracle Morning community regularly. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of members in our, like our Facebook group. And we, um, it's, it averages 70, 72% that say they had never in their life been a morning person until they read the book. And now they do the miracle morning, you know, five, six days a week, seven days a week. Right. So it's like most people, and that was my biggest fear of writing the book is I'm like, how am I going to convince people that said, will tell you, you know, live and die by, I am not a morning person that they yeah. should become one. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so that, but the majority of people, yeah, were it's like also funny. Brandon Turner's. Yeah. It's also funny. Like when you say things like I am not a morning person, right? Like they the most powerful words are the words that follow. I am. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I am not a morning. Well, that's because you keep saying you're not a morning person. Yeah. I noticed years ago, I started saying, I don't, I, I don't like the phone. I'm not good at the phone. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not a phone person. I would say that. And I, and now today I hate the phone. I made myself that way. When I was younger, I used to use the phone all the time. Yeah. But I made myself not like the phone just by saying totally. I don't, I'm not a phone person. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it, 100%. Like I used to hate running and then I committed to run. During the Miracle Morning, I was like asking myself, what's level 10 success in every area of my life? I did, right, I did this like wheel of life. You've probably seen that. Yep, yep. And, uh, and I did, you know, what level 10 in my relationships, my health, blah, blah, blah. And fitness I was like, dude, running an ultra, because I had two friends that had run an ultra marathon and I've I had never run more than a mile. And that was only in mm -hmm. PE class in high school when they made you do it once a year and I hated I every hated moment, that right? Moment, yeah. And I, I'm like, dude, level 10 success would be doing what my buddies did and running a 52 mile ultra marathon. I have no 
no idea. Like that's not, that's not even possible. The idea, I hate it, but I'm like, who would I have to become? That's like, that became the miracle morning game for me. It's who am I becoming every day? Who would I have to become to achieve that? Right? And so the point is, I never in my life, I, just like I'm not a morning person, I've tried, I hate it, can't become one. That's how it was with running. And, um, and then I, you know, I started running and, you know, I started out with half a mile one day and then a mile and then, right? And then eventually 52 miles in a day, you know? So yeah, you, you can transform yeah. any belief that you have about yourself, right? We, within, we have a tribe called the Better Life Tribe. So it's, uh, it's the, all for charity, but we have like a thousand-ish members, give or take. Uh, and the idea of the whole tribe is, yeah, you get the results of what you repeatedly do. Mm -hmm. So find people who are already doing it, figure out what they're doing, what they believe and what their actions are, and then just do that. You'll get the results. Very similar to what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, but in, in there, uh, we do a thing called identity-based goal setting. I'm a big fan of that. Where instead of like, I, I want a new car, I want more money, you always start your goal setting with, you start, we always start with wheel of life, that idea. Yeah. But then when you have a category, you know you want to work on. I want to be a better parent. Okay. Like, what's your identity statement in there? Like, instead of starting from I want, but start from I am. Mm. So I am a whatever parent, a present parent that's focused on my kids and you know, blah, 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 right? I am a Greek God body, right? Like there's ways yeah. like to, to think through like- You've obviously been saying that one, dude. Look uh, at all you. The, I mean, look at me. <laughs> Jeez, you want me to take my shirt off? I mean, I was getting a little weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the idea is that when you, when you start with I am, or you start from identity, then we can figure out what actions and what, what things come behind that. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think so much of life is dictated by those words that, that you know, the affirmation. Hey, will you come on my podcast and uh, the achieve your goals mm. podcast and mm. talk about that? Maybe I will. Right. Make, make a note of it. Cause I'll oh, forget. Achieve your goals. <laughs> I have brain damage. Team. <laughs> I just snapped at them. <laughs> I love you all. You're amazing. Uh, uh, I have no memory. Yeah. So I'm going to lose that in about a minute, but whatever. All right. We'll make it happen. I all want right. to brand it on the podcast. Yeah, keep going. Uh, um, five all right, tips. So number one is set your intention before bed, right? And the best way to do it is in writing so that you have this bedtime affirmation that you can just pull up, read it, and then set it back on the bedside table. All right. um, number two is move your alarm clock as far away as possible. And that's actually, I had a CEO once. I was speaking at EO in New York. And he said, I, I don't know if Hal's going to mention this, so I want to make sure I mention it. Um, he has this little five-step strategy in his book. Like, there's one of them, move your alarm clock. He goes, that was the game changer for me. If it wasn't for that, I'd still be snoozing through my alarm clock, but now I do my miracle morning every day, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so here's the point. If your alarm clock is within arm's reach, let's say, I call it your wake-up motivation level. When the alarm goes off, your wake-up motivation level is usually like at a one or a two out of a scale of 10, Right? If you can reach over and hit the snooze button or turn your alarm off, you're, right, you're trying to have the discipline to get out of bed when you're at a one or a two. If you have the alarm clock across the room, I keep mine in my bathroom so I can go right into the brush and the teeth, right? But once you have to get out of bed, you're already at like a three or a four, you're, you're standing up. Now you're, you're walking, you're breathing oxygen, right? Your heart rate's up. So by the time you get to the alarm, you're probably at a five or a six, it is infinitely easier to stay awake and become a quote unquote morning person when you're at a five or six than when you're at a one or a two. So that strategy, that little tip alone is a game changer. That's really good. Have you, have you had, uh, used the app Alarmy? No. Uh, so I love this app. So the Alarmy, uh, when I'm, when I'm struggling with the snooze button, when if I get fall back into a bad pattern, Alarmy is an app that's an alarm clock, but you, they, in order to turn the alarm off, you have to do certain actions. Like I math, that, like a code like or code, something? Like math yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like it because like, I'll, I'll, it'll be simple problems. Like you can choose what difficulty, but I'll be like eight plus 32 plus 14. And when you're waking up, you're like, eight plus 30, I can't figure it out. So you're sitting there trying to work <laughs> on it. And by the time you get that, you have to answer yeah, three yeah. math questions. Your, your mind's awake. You're yeah. working. Another one they have on there is you can take, it. it's so good. Hold, can, on, hold on. Go Team, <laughs> send me alarmy. <laughs> it's so good. The other one is you said it ahead of time. Is the night before you said it um, as a, U, a UPC, is that what they call the UPC code on the gallon of milk in the fridge or anything in your house. And it will not stop ringing unless you scan it with That's your phone. That's amazing. Isn't that good? What's that one called? You know? That same thing, alarmy. Same oh, app. Oh, alarmy gives yeah. you that option. Alarmy okay. gives you that option. Yeah, there's a bunch of them on there. Oh, anyway. I got I to gotta put that in the new book. Yeah, yeah you should throw it in Seriously, there. Seriously, like, send me alarmy. <laughs> I, I need. Yeah, yeah, it's legit. It's because like. Yeah, you just can't shut it off. Well, you shut off for like 30 seconds. So you're not like yeah. hearing it with waking up your family. Oh, but, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. been a game changer. Oh, anyway, great. all right. So, uh, all right, so uh, yeah, number one. three, um, uh, and you can choose to either do three or four first. We'll just say brush your teeth. Okay. And, and I, like I say in the book, Hal, did you really put in writing, you told me to brush my teeth? Here's the point. Every minute, every second, but every minute you're awake, your wake up motivation level that starts at a one or a two 
it increases the longer you are awake and upright. So doing the point of it is to do mindless tasks yep. that take zero discipline, very little effort, but keep you upright, right? So the alarm clock for me, right? It's right next to the sink. So I then brush my teeth and then step four is drink a f- glass of water as much as possible. Um, and the reason is, and this is something that no one teaches us, but when you are seven or eight hours, depending on how long you sleep without water, you wake up mildly dehydrated. Yep. Dehydration and fatigue causes fatigue. In fact, even any time of day, if you're tired, you might be dehydrated and not actually need sleep, right? So that, so I basically, like a college kid at a keg party, I just go, 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 like I down about half the water. Uh, and then I just start sipping the rest when I'm out in the living room. Um, and then step five is get dressed in your workout clothes right? Again, more time, awake, upright, moving your body. And then you're going to do a little exercise as part of your miracle morning. Anyway, that's one of the six practices. And, uh, and then you're signaling, Hey, it's not time to go back to bed. I'm there. And then if there's a bonus tip, it's do not do your miracle morning in your bed Mm. because it's like a, it's like a smoker trying to quit smoking and keeping a pack of cigarettes with an arm's reach, right? Like it's way too easy to fall back to sleep. So for me, I, like we have our little sitting room in the front, right? We have, I've got a little table there and we've got my books there, my journals there, right? All of my meditation pillow, like all the Miracle Morning stuff I'm going to do. It's all sitting out there and that's my spot. Oh, I love it, man. Have you played yeah. with uh, dehyd- uh, uh, for the dehydration thing? Have you played with salt water versus regular water? Um, I did that for a little bit after I read Aubrey Marcus's book, Own yeah. the Day, yep. I think it is called. Um, and I just, I, I, I have no excuse. I should do salt and li- salt and lemon, actually, is what I should do. Yeah, I, I, I just saw a podcast clip of uh, uh, Andrew Huberman the other day talking about like how he drinks a glass of salt water in the morning because it, yeah, some electrolyte something. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, it replaces the minerals and yeah. yeah, there's it's yeah, don't don't. That's a case where. Don't do as I do. Do as, uh, as Andrew Huber- Huberman says. <laughs> yeah, do it that, yeah, do what Andrew says. Uh, there's also, I, I've been playing with this idea. And if you know Andrew and you can <laughs> recommend me as a guest for his podcast, I would. <laughs> that would be great. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. I'll call my buddy Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure at all. Uh, I wouldn't call him. Uh, <laughs> the, the greens, uh, athletic greens. There's a bunch of different companies that do that. Have you, yeah. have you done that? Is that uh, like, you know, downing water with something else, protein powder or greens or is it just so water? So what I do, actually, here's a little little hack this is actually what i started doing probably a few months ago and i love this um i debated whether or not to put it in the miracle morning book um i did put it in though and i said that how i wasn't gonna put this in but here you go um so what i do is i actually i buy this green tea so there's this company called it's p-i-q-u-e peak teas and the teas are micro like micro powder they grind it up into a fine powder so you can like you tear it open little packet and you put it into room temperature water and you almost barely stir it and it'll just dissolve right so i get a little like eight ounce carafe like this little tiny mason jar thing um and uh and before bed i put one of those little green teas in it's got about 50 milligrams of caffeine um however green tea also has uh, L-theanine, which balances out the effects of caffeine so you don't have the crash. Mm. It also has polyphenols, um, which I don't know what those are, but I know the word. And, uh, <laughs> and I do know those have shown to be cancer, like cancer fighting compound, right? It's supposed to be help against cancer. So when my alarm goes off, I turn it off. I grab that off my nightstand. I shoot the little green tea Um, and then I get up and I do my other five step or four steps in the process while I'm doing that, the caffeine's kicking in, which is helping with my mental clarity and alertness, right? Give me a little energy. I have my water that I also drink kind of right after that. Um, so that's my little hack. So I do start with that. Um, and then, uh, and then I don't drink anything usually for a bit. And my first beverage or first meal beverage is a green smoothie and I use Organifi's, uh, that's my, they're one of my sponsors for the podcast. I've been a customer nice. there since way before they sponsored me. So, um, uh, yeah, so I do Organifi like their green juice and their red juice and their protein powder and all that. Speaking of podcast sponsors, oh. let's get to this week's podcast, uh, ad, but, uh, on the show, uh, we always ask the guest, is there a mission charity cause that you just care about that we can give all the ad revenue from this episode toward? Like what cause do you care about? Oh, there's a lot. I'd go heroes for children. Heroes for children. Yeah, they what? actually we don't we we they, we uh, we chose them when I put, the Miracle Morning movie came out, um, and uh, they help kids with cancer. And mm-hmm. uh, I was going through cancer when the movie was being filmed. You know, 
halfway through filming the movie, like I called my director. I'm like, Hey, I have this like really aggressive form of cancer and I have a 20% chance of surviving. So I really don't care about the movie anymore. <laughs> like, I just have to survive for my family. And it was wild. He, he's a friend. His, Nick, his name is Nick Conadera. And uh, he said, he's like, you know, he was, he was there for me and he talked to me. He's like, how, oh my gosh, you know? And he said, Hey, I, I, I don't want to overstep. He said, but I, I know you and I have pretty much no doubt in my mind that whatever the odds are, you're going to beat this. I was like, okay, thank you. I, that's great. He goes, and I think I should film you beating it. Hmm. He said, I, I don't think the movie should be on hold. This is the movie now. He's like, and I was like, uh, it just totally caught me off guard. And I was like, let me talk to Ursula and see what she says. And I, you know, I'm like, Hey, Nick wants to like fly out and film me getting chemo and like interview me and like, you know, follow me around. And, she was, you know, anyway, long story short, we ended up saying yes. And thank God we did. Cause you've seen the movie. Yeah. No, dude. not yet. Dude. I am. I'm again, I'm walking out for the, I'm walking out for the second time. I was waiting for my, waiting for my copy. I don't All know. Right. I just, I'm uh, looking Miracle at Miracle the... Morning. It's on the homepage now. It's free. Miraclemorning.com. I only, I only watch DVDs. Yeah. So oh, I'm going to need yeah. the DVD. Actually, we have, that's the funny part. You say that <laughs> that's a whole nother story, but I ordered 5,000 DVDs because my director's old school and he said I should. And oh, we have funny. a warehouse of like 4,970 <laughs> DVDs. Um, I just give them out and I'm like, Hey, go watch this on Amazon prime. Yeah. Literally I give them out. I, I bought stickers that say also available at miraclemorning.com and Amazon prime. That's and, funny. I, and I just use the DVDs like a business card. Yep, I'm like, Hey, you probably don't have a DVD player, but see that sticker. This is just a reminder to watch it on Amazon. That's so funny. That's but actually anyways, a clever so, idea. Like for a marketing thing is dude, to send DVDs. You're right. That's a good yeah. idea. They're only a buck a piece or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right? They're fairly cheap. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a, yeah. It's like a tangible business card. Anyway, that's a I good, like it. You're, I, you're really, yeah. So yeah. I thank you. You just helped me get over my frustration <laughs> with the fact that I wasted money on 4,000 DVDs. You gotta be more confident. Turn everything you do as a mistake into a, as into on purpose. Remember, that's my superpower and yeah. I, I don't always apply. It. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but no, so, and if, but if you're watching the movie, right, I don't like spoiler alert, the original vision for the film, it, it started because Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki, was it the Go Abundance event? Yeah. Were you there? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. When yeah. he keynoted in Tahoe? Uh, yeah. Was I at that one? I've seen him talk so many times now. I don't remember okay. if I was at that one. <laughs> so I was his warm-up act. And, um, and then uh, I, I got to have dinner with him afterwards with, the, with David and you know, with the, 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 Go Bro, the elders of Go Abundance. And, um, and I, had, I had brought a copy of The Miracle Morning, which was like you know, probably two years out at that time. And, uh, and I had signed, written a note for him. And it was under the table, like on my lap. And I was trying to, I was in my head having these like insecure conversations. I'm like, dude, you're going to look like a goober. Like, don't, who cares? He's not going to read it. He's Robert Kiyosaki. He's worth like $80 million. He doesn't need your little self-published book on how to wake up early. And, uh, and then thank God Wayne Gretzky showed up in that moment. Not actually, but oh, like. I was like, really? Yeah, no, but his quote, you miss all the shots oh, you don't take, yeah, right? Like yeah. literally I thought of it and I was like, dude, I have nothing to lose. He doesn't know who I am. If I think I'm a goober, who cares? He didn't know who I am. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I wait till the end of the dinner and I approach him and I'm like, Robert, you know, you're, I love your book, you know? And I said, Hey, I wrote that. I go, look, I don't even think, I, I don't know. I was all insecure and I did look like a goober, gave him the book. Dude, I get an email three weeks later from his assistant and she says, raw, I'm paraphrasing, but Robert has read the miracle morning three times in the last three weeks. And my jaw hits the floor. I'm like, wow, what? And, uh, and he'd like to, he, it's changing his life. He does it every day with his wife. And he wants to have you on Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's awesome. uh, or Rich, sorry, Rich Dad Radio. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I'm like, and the funny part is I go tell my wife. I'm like, sweetie, you'll never believe it. Robert Kiyosaki. Da, 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 da. She's like, who's Robert Kiyosaki? <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, you're no fun to tell this He's a big deal I can't celebrate world. with you. He's, he's yeah. like huge. He's huge. <laughs> and um, we're like, oh, so the reason my buddy was trying to convince me to do the Miracle Morning documentary. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so busy. I like, that's a cool idea, but I don't even know. And, uh, and then when Robert had me on the podcast and he was such a fan, I get off and I call Nick. I go, hey, I think we could get Robert Kiyosaki to be in the movie talking about the Miracle Morning. If he says yes, we can like we could leverage that. Like anybody yeah. would say yes at that point. I was like, if Robert says yes, I'll, I'll do the movie. So we email Robert. He's like, dude, I, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. And so, um, so we started filming. So the movie was like, it was basically following my journey of, of trying to change 1 million lives one morning at a time. Like I went to Paris to do a media tour and my, my director came, you know, flew with me and we had that footage. And then there's me like doing my miracle morning video blogs and all this stuff. And then we started interviewing 
Robert Kiyosaki about his morning routine, Brendan Burchard, Mel Robbins, Lewis Howes, Layla Ali, Muhammad Ali's daughter, you know, all these folks, Joe Polish. And um, that was the original film. And then I get cancer. So like when you're watching the movie at the 60 minute mark, it takes this not violent turn, almost violent turn. Like, and now the last 30 minutes are me fighting for my life while weaving in the other. Anyway, so, so yeah, so that, uh, I forgot. How I got on those three <laughs> tangents good. all at once. That's good, man. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us into a, a couple. First of all, I wanna I wanna go through Miracle Morning. The pro, we should hit savers. Yes, right. Happy. So people know there, and then from there, I wanna go into cancer. I don't yeah. wanna get I don't wanna get cancer. You wanna I wanna, go into can- I wanna yeah. get no, into your yeah. cancer story. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's real easy. Savers. Somebody else's yes, cancer. It's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier. All right. So savers. All right. So for so everyone, so you understand what savers are. It's an acronym that that represent the six practices of the Miracle Morning. Originally, it was meditation. That became silence, the first S in savers. The A is for affirmations. The V is for visualization. The E is for exercise. The R is for reading. The final S originally was journaling, but again, that that would have messed up the, it would have been saver, right? (laughs) Weird acronym. So that became scribing, which is a fancy, pretentious word for writing. Um, (laughs) And uh, and so... um, I'm actually going to say what Robert said. At the end of our interview with Robert Kiyosaki, he said, um, Hal, and I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, before you wrote The Miracle Morning and you came up with the acronym SAVERS, which he said, I, I think is brilliant. He said, every successful person on the planet swore by at least one of the SAVERS and attributed their success. Some people, it was their meditation. Some, it was their visualization. A lot of professional athletes, right? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of millionaires will tell you it's the books they read, right? It's the reading yep. portion. Um, Jim Rohn would say journaling was his favorite of all the practices, right? He said, any one of those will change your life. He said, but before Miracle Morning and, and, and the acronym, he said, no one, I've never heard of anyone that did all six practices, especially in one ritual. And he said, because any one of them will save your, change your life. He said, when you do all six, he goes, and I'm speaking from experience, you, you titled the book correctly, The Miracle Morning. I'm experiencing miracles I can't even describe. He goes, everything. My health's improved. My mental health's improved. My, you know, every area of my life, my marriage is improving. And he said, and so, so that's, I think, like almost beginning with the end in terms of the savers are the six most timeless, proven personal development practices in the history of humanity that the world's most successful people in all walks of life have sworn by for centuries. And if one will change your life, when you combine all six and the beauty of the miracle morning is it's totally customizable. You can do a 30-minute miracle morning, a 60-minute miracle morning. There's a chapter in the book called the six-minute miracle morning where you literally do one focused, highly intentional minute of each of the savers and you get phenomenal benefits. So that's the high level of the savers. And if you want to go into any one of them, I'm happy to do that. Well, do you know Cossum? Yeah, I love Cossum. Yeah, okay. So Cossum's a good buddy of mine. Uh, I figured you know him. You know everybody. Yeah. Uh, so Cossum, and Cossum knows everybody. So, yeah. and apparently I know a couple people. So Cossum asked me the other day, he said, Brandon, what is the hinge that swings the door in your life? What's the hinge that swings the door? Mm. And my answer was... The miracle morning. Well, I said a morning routine. Getting up oh, early oh, is what right. I said. I said getting up early. Right. When I get up early... I then have time to work out. Yeah. When I get up early, I am, uh, I'm reading a business book. When I get up early, I'm reading my Bible. So I get my spiritual life hit. Yeah. I, I, I exercise more likely. I'm uh, more calm in the morning. I spend time with the kids. I help them get ready in the morning. I'm, I'm present with my wife. Yeah. Every single solitary area of my life is better, yeah. except for one. Hmm. And when I wake up too early... I go to bed too early at night, and so my sex life is dead. Right? So there's, a, there's a balance there, right? When I, I was like a 4 a.m. guy for a while, and then I was like falling asleep before the kids every night. I'm yeah, like, all right, yeah. 4 a.m. is too early. Yeah. So now I'm like a 5.30 guy, yeah. and that, that works out much better. But yeah. that, that definitely like waking up early for me and for almost everybody I know, that is the hinge that swings the door. Yeah. Everything depends on that, and everything's better when I do that. Well, I read an article when I was researching and writing The Miracle Morning by uh, a blogger uh, and an author. His name is Steve Pavlina, and uh, he wrote Personal Development for Smart People. That's his book. Um, but he wrote an article called The Rudder of the Day, mm. and he said just like the way the rudder is pointed on a ship determines the direction of the ship. He said, your morning is the rudder of the day. Yes. If you have an unfocused, unproductive, last minute morning, that's how you're showing up to the day. If you have a focused, productive, clarity, right? Like growth oriented morning, 
dude, that's how you're showing up to the day. And so if you win the morning, that was just kind of his, the, 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 the essence of it. You are setting yourself up to win the day. All right, before we talk about the, uh, the journey through cancer, uh, I want to know the chicken or the egg answer from you. In other words, it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What, what comes first? Like, if I got to wake up early, I'm not used to, let's say I, I don't do the miracle morning. I don't want to wake up early, right? I go to bed at midnight or mm-hmm. 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. You're telling me to set my alarm for four, five, six, whatever. I don't know if you have yep. a, but early, that's not enough sleep. All the scientific studies show I need eight hours of yep. sleep or whatever, right? So now do I, do I just get short sleep for a few days first or do I try to reset my time earlier at night? Like what, how do you recommend? Tactically? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't recommend, uh, depriving yourself of sleep unless you're sleeping like nine hours. You mm-hmm. don't need that. Um, yeah. in fact, you know, and most, most studies show that you need seven to eight hours, right? That's usually the sweet spot, but, but it's, it's an interesting in terms of, there are a lot of variables that most people don't ever think about. Example, your diet arguably impacts your sleep more than anything else. Mm. If you eat unhealthy food, processed food, red and blue dyes, things that are not healthy for your body, then when you're sleeping, your body is trying to detoxify and it's not getting the rest that it needs. If you eat late at night, and I mean late as in like, it takes, it usually takes about two to three hours to digest a meal. Um, And it depends on the meal, right? If you have high fiber, like fruits and vegetables, and that's your last meal, it's going to go through you much quicker. If you eat fried food or pizza, dude, you might be, you know, four hours and it's still hardly getting through you. Um, you think about that when you, if you eat late at night, an hour before bed, let's say when you are sleeping, your body is not sleeping, right? Like there, like there's, and I can't explain the science of which part of you is asleep, but the bottom line is your body is working. Mm. It is digesting food all night long. And, and, and that's, you know, more often than not, if you wake up feeling like you were hit by a truck, right? That's a very popular expression. Oh, I felt like I was hit by a truck. Yep. There's a, there's a chance. Maybe you ate too late. And it might have been, it could have been sugar, could have just been, again, a meal. For me, I eat dinner at, I try to eat dinner three hours before I, actually three and a half hours. I try to finish eating three hours before I go to bed. Mm. So, um, and then the, the, to answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, go to, if you're, you know, go to bed 30 minutes earlier. Like when I do the Miracle Morning, when I give a keynote and I end with the, here, all right, guys, none of this matters unless you do it, right? Same thing with this podcast. So you actually, perfect way to, 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 to share this. Um, here's the miracle morning 30 day challenge in the simple way. Wake up 30 minutes earlier. Okay. You could do an hour. Sure. But the less you have to shift your schedule, the less you have to change your current habits and behavior, the easier it is to do. So my first miracle morning was an hour earlier. And then I, after a week went to two hours, like I loved it. Right. And a lot of people do an hour miracle morning, but just wake up 30 minutes earlier. And so specific to your question about staying up late, going to bed, go to bed 30 minutes earlier. Instead of going to bed at midnight, go to bed at 1130, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And here's the deal. If your body is used to going to bed at midnight, you might try to go to bed at 1130, but you don't fall asleep till your normal time. So in that case, yes, force yourself up 30 minutes earlier, right? And, 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 it, and that thing is, that's not going to make or break you anyway. It's 30 yeah. minutes. But keep doing that until you start falling asleep. You know, it starts shifting the bedtime, yeah. right? But that's my recommendation is whatever time you're waking up earlier, if it's 30 minutes or an hour, go to bed 30 minutes or an hour earlier. And for most people... They're, that's not their productive time. Like, yeah. what are you doing at midnight? You're probably, you might, you're probably watching TV or you're on your phone. Yeah, just scrolling TikTok. Right? And I want to yeah. say this, you know, you know, Pat Flynn, yep. smart passive income podcast, author of Will It Fly. Uh, I, I want to be on Pat's podcast for a long time because I just love Pat. He's such a, just a sweet human, right? Just so genuine. Love him. And so um, I was a fan, didn't know who he was, didn't know him. He didn't know who I was. And I, I, I reached out once and, you know, got a, sorry, we're full, blah, blah, blah. And then he reached out to me like a year later and he's like, Hal, I want to be on the podcast. People keep telling me about your book and I'm not a morning person. So, you know, I'm not like, I want, I want to like hear your, your, your pitch. Why should I be a morning person? I'm like, cool. So I get on his show and he starts out by saying, so Hal, I told you I'm not a morning person. And he said, and I don't really have any desire to become one. And I'm going, oh, this is like an uphill battle. (laughs) (laughs) He said, I wake up every morning when my, I don't have, I don't set an alarm. I wake up when my kids come in and shake me and go, daddy, daddy, daddy. I go, dude, how am I going to convince this guy who's already making like seven figures, runs marathons, has a great marriage. And he wakes up in the most beautiful way I could ever imagine. So I basically just 
tell my story. I, you know, I give my pitch on why the miracle morning works and thank God it got through. And at the end he goes, Hal, you've convinced me. He goes, I, I'm a pretty productive person. I think that I am missing out on possibly another level of productivity by not doing exactly Brandon, what you just said, which is when you wake up a little earlier and you start your day with that space to focus on G- journaling, reading, meditating, exercising, right? Getting in that state before the kids wake up, before you're, you're, you're responding and reacting to the demands of your day. It's a life changer. So he said, I'm committed. I'm going to do it for 30 days and I'm going to post it publicly on my social people. You guys can follow me. Want to do it with me. Great. Um, and Adam, you know, not Adam. Where that come from? Pat is now a uh, you know he's a lifelong Miracle Morning practitioner. He was in the Mir- he's in the Miracle Morning documentary. You know, that's awesome. um, right? But the, so that's someone that was a night owl, super successful, and realized there was another level of productivity if he did the Miracle Morning and he stuck with it. Same thing. Robert Kiyosaki, I think he was worth like eighty million dollars when he read the Miracle Morning. Read every you know he's a con- like fanatical reader. It changed his life. So, and, and I always, I say, I say this joke sometimes in my speech. I go, I'll tell the Robert Kiyosaki story and he's worth 80 million. And then my story, and you know, I was dead broke when I created the Miracle Morning. I go, so if you're wondering if this applies to your situation, if you're anywhere between dead broke and an $80 million <laughs> net worth, if you're in that range. It should work. <laughs> it should work for you. <laughs> if you're out of that range, probably not the book for you. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Hey, uh, book uh, question for you. Have you read the book or heard of it? The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Yes. Uh, John Mark Homer. You read that one? I own it. Team, text me. Yeah. <laughs> say Because I never, I didn't finish it. I need to read it. I'm, Dude, I'm yeah. texting myself right now. Okay. That book, I mean, it's, it's a Christian book uh, by a pastor named John Mark Homer, but it is the probably, I mean, best or top five best books I read in the past decade. I mean, it, it changed my life in such a dramatic way. And one of the chapters or segments in there is Tell about me, what's the, title again? Uh, the ruthless elimination of hurry, mm. ruthless elimination yeah. of hurry. But he makes the point in there when you have that morning time, he doesn't call it miracle morning, but he just, when you have that morning silence, he calls it like the, the, the silence time. Uh, and he really stresses that point of it, how it affects every other part of your day in terms of your peace and your lack of rush and hurry in your life. Yeah. And I thought it was such a, it was such a brilliantly and beautifully written book about that, like basically that one piece that of the saver. So yeah. yeah, I love that book. But all right, moving on. Uh, let's talk about getting cancer. Yeah. When did you find out? How did you find out? So um, I, again, 2016, it was again, right when my wife and I were, you know, going through our stuff. Um, the I woke up in the middle of the night going <gasps> couldn't breathe and I woke my wife up you know and she's um she's great she's great in emergencies like I freeze and she knows exactly what to do right and uh so she's like she gets me up and uh sits me up she puts a bunch of <laughs> it's funny puts a bunch of pillows behind me and it was like I was like from that moment on I was like because I, I used to get her crap I'm like why do you have all these pillows on the bed we don't use these <laughs> all these decorative pillows are so stupid and like that day, I'm like, all right, this now is helpful. Now we know. Yeah. So I'm sitting up and I'm like, you know, I'm barely sleeping because I'm sleeping sitting up, which is not, not easy. And then the next day, it's not better. And so she sends me to the ER. They misdiagnose me with pneumonia and give me a Z pack of antibiotics. They said, if it doesn't get better, go get a second opinion. They were really convicted in that part. Yeah. <laughs> like he wasn't certain. He saw a mass on my lung. Mm. Um, wasn't, ended up not being pneumonia. So like, a day or two goes by and I can't breathe. Um, he drained my lung of fluid. Uh, and I, and I go back and I go to the ER. I can't breathe. My lungs full again of fluid. And, uh, and then this went on for 11 days. Every other day I'm going into the ER having one to two liters of fluid drained from my lung and they don't know what's wrong. Finally, I go see this doctor and, uh, he was, I just moved to Texas like a couple months before. So it's a new doctor. I've only seen him for like my first checkup. And, uh, and we do all the, t- a bunch of tests. I go home, get a call the next day. And my wife was out of town because we had a, 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 a trip scheduled to see my grandma. And first time she was going to get to visit the grandkids, you know, my daughter was f- seven. My son was four. And so I'm like, you guys, but I couldn't go cause I couldn't breathe. I go, you guys go without me. I don't want to leave. My poor grandma's going to be so sad that I can't be there. Like you guys got to at least go. So I go, I get a call from the, the, the nurse and uh, she says, doctor would like to, you to come in so he can go over results. And I go, oh, can you like give me a little bit of, tell me what's going on? She goes, no, he wants to tell you in person. And I go, oh, that's Uh-oh. usually not good. So I go and, and he says, it's so funny. This brings back all the lessons I shared earlier. He goes, 
Um, well, Hal, um, uh, saw some something on your lung, definitely. And, we, and he's just beating around the bush. He's like, ah, you know, there's definitely uh, something there. And, then, and, then. and I can tell he's like having trouble telling me what he found, like what he thinks it is. And so I lean in, no, not kidding. I put my hand on his arm. I go, doctor. I said, hey, I said, I, I can tell you're having trouble telling me, like, I don't know, maybe it's bad news. I said, I want you to know, I live my life by this thing called the five minute rule. Oh, no way. <laughs> and I go, whatever you're going to tell me right now, I'm at peace with it. You could tell me I'm going to die. And I'm, if that's my reality, I'm at peace with it. He goes, okay, okay, well, looks like you have cancer. And I was like, oh. what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was not expecting that, you know? I was like, oh, uh, he's like, I, I'm not sure what kind it is, but it, it looks like we need to get more testing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, all right. And so I go out to the car and uh, he's like, I'm going to schedule you for more tests. And I call Ursula. She's at the zoo with my mom who had flown out to meet her with my grandma. And uh, I, you know, I'm like, I'm just, I, I'm just thinking how my wife's going to receive this and my mom's going to receive this on my grandma. And, you know, like I'm, I literally am at peace with it. I'm like, all right, I have cancer, so I'll figure that out, right? Like, there's no point in being distraught over it. I can't change it, so I'm just going to figure it out, right? Like, that's how the mind... Once you practice the five-minute that's the point. When you practice the five-minute rule, at first it sounds like five minutes is not enough time to be upset. Like, I need more than five minutes. Yeah. And the first time I set my timer for five minutes, it went off. I was like, it was a tangent, but it's, it's important. I go, I'm still pissed. Like, dude, and five more minutes, right? But here's the crazy thing. After about a week of that, I remember I had a customer cancel the biggest order I ever had in my, in my short little sales career. And I set the timer for five minutes. I'm like, dude, how could she do that? Like, ah, I, I know she could afford it. And I needed that. I was, that, that got me over my goal for the week. What am I going to do now? I'm like, I guess I got to get on the phone. And I picked up the timer and I was like, there was like four minutes and 32 seconds. Left. <laughs> and I was like, oh, whoa. I was like, why don't I just say can't change it now? And then I literally, in that moment, I was like, dude, I'm going to do the five second rule. Why be upset for five minutes over something I can't change when I can just literally mm. snap my fingers and go, I can't change it. What can I do now? Like, so just for anybody listening, like, that's the evolution. And that's, I mean, I've shared this. I've had, you know, I have hundreds of emails from people saying this can't change at philosophy. I know we're shifting to that, but like it, it changed their life. Like they're like, dude, I got divorced. I was depressed for like a year. I learned about the fact that, oh, I just have the choice to accept it and move on. And I did. And now I'm not depressed anymore. Right. So anyway, but so I called my wife and she was just, you know, you can imagine, right? Like in her mind, I know the way she thinks I had taught her can't change it for years. It never stuck. Right. <laughs> She's like, I'm tired. don't tell you your motivational bullshit. I, I could be upset for more than five minutes if I want. I'm like, all right. Uh, but I, so I knew she probably was going to process it, which is like, my husband is going to die possibly likely maybe. Right. And um, so she breaks down in tears. And I said, sweetheart, um, you know, I said, I, I live by the miracle equation, which is this, that's another book I wrote after cancer because of cancer. I was like, I have unwavering faith that I'm going to beat this cancer and I'm going to do everything in my power. Everything, everything, relentlessly pursue every option, including every holistic practice, which I did. And, uh, and I'm going to beat cancer. I just want you to know that. So you have nothing, you know, you, I, mm. uh, you're allowed to be afraid. But I'm telling you, in my mind, there's a 100% chance that I will beat this cancer. Um, so that's how I found out, and and uh, and that's and then one other piece of it is, you know, she comes, she flies home, and we go to get a second opinion at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is like one of the top cancer centers in the in the country. And then I find out which cancer it is, and I'm there in the office. She's holding my hand under the table, and the oncologist says, "This cancer, um, you know, it's it's not good. You have uh, it's acute lymphoblastic leukemia." Uh, it's a 20 to 30% survival rate. So I mean, you can mm. imagine, especially with two kids, man, I'm like, yeah. right. The other, the other side of that is 70 to 80% chance you're going to die and leave your kids without a dad and your wife without a husband. So she's squeezing, my wife is squeezing my hand under the table at that point so hard. Um, and he said, you need to start chemo in the next 24 hours. Uh, or no, he said, you need to start chemo immediately because at that point not only they discovered not only was my lung failing my heart was on the verge of failing and they had to send me for an immediate procedure where they stuck a thick needle through my chest because there was an eighth of an inch thick sack flu of fluid around my heart 
And they said it was growing. And if it got any bigger, my heart would not be able to beat and I would experience heart failure. And they'd have to perform open heart surgery on me. So they said, but I had to sign a waiver saying this is a dangerous procedure because the sack of fluid is only an eighth of an inch thick and we're going to puncture the needle. But it could happen that if your heart beats, it could puncture your heart and we'll also have to perform open heart surgery. So you have to sign this waiver saying we're not liable for killing you. So, and then my kidneys were failing. And so, um, the doctors didn't start chemo. And I said, look, doc, I don't want to use chemo. It's poison. No offense. I know it's your thing that you sell. Uh, <laughs> I said, but I want, to, I, I want to approach this holistically. I had watched a documentary years before called Healing Cancer from the Inside Out. And all these cancer patients that were told you have no chance of making it. And they healed their cancer naturally. And he said, okay, but how, he goes, I respect that you want to do that. Your cancer is so deadly and so fast acting. It's so aggressive. He said, you're on the verge of dying right now. You don't have the luxury of changing your diet or trying some holistic practice. He goes, I mean that sincerely. He said, literally, I would give you one, based on your condition now, now that we punctured the heart, and did, you have one to two weeks before your organs completely shut down and you die. Mm. And so I said, well, can I at least have 24 hours to go home and, and talk about this? And he goes, yeah, but I would decide tomorrow. And so I went home and I researched and I, I found two of the best holistic oncologists in America. Uh, one of them was Suzanne Summers, doctor that beat her cancer naturally. Uh, I called both of them and they both said, uh, your, your oncologist is not exaggerating. Your particular cancer, we cannot, we, we would not take the risk. You, you literally probably have a, if he's telling you of a week or two based on your organ failure, that's very normal. This cancer kills people in a few weeks. Um, your best option is chemo. And that was hard for me to hear because I'm like, I know what it's going to do to my body. And, and, and by the way, Brandon, the chemo regimen, because this cancer is so fast acting and so aggressive, it's one of the most aggressive chemo regimens known to man. I mean, a lot of people's chemo, they'll do like one hour a month or one hour a week. I did a hundred hours every three weeks. Ooh. I ended up doing 750 hours of chemo in seven months. Um, and most people die from the chemo. That's why the, the survival rate is so low. And you think about it, the doctor saying, if you trust me with your life and do my medicine, you have a 20 to 30% chance of surviving, right? Yeah. And if you don't, you're probably going to die either. Like, so yeah. anyway, if so, you don't, so it's 100%. It's 100%. Much, and, that's what he's yep. saying. And so oh. what I did is I just did the best of both. I said, okay, I'm going to do your chemo because it seems like that's my only option. If the best holistic oncologists aren't going to see me, I'm not going to go rogue and do it on my own. But I'm going to also take 100% responsibility for my recovery. I'm not going to count on you guys. You don't, at the end of the day, you don't care. I'm just a number on your, on your balance sheet, right? I'm going to relentlessly research every holistic option and protocol and methodology available. And I'm going to implement every single one. And I did. Um, I did three coffee enemas a week. I took, did ozone sauna, lymphatic massage. I took 70 supplements a day. That's a lot of pills to swallow. Um, I did, um, what else? Organic, vegan, raw diet, juicing. I mean, you name it. I did, and I doubled down on Miracle Morning. I actually, every single one of my savers beating cancer became my entire focus. I meditated on the feeling of being completely healed. And I prayed that I would beat cancer during my silence. I had affirmations that were affirming that I was committed to being cancer, what I was committed to doing to beat it, why it was a must for me. I visualized my cells healing every day. I exercise in what I would exercise. You know, what are, what are exercises that oxygenate your cells to beat cancer? I read books on beating cancer. I journaled every day on my progress and what I was committed. I mean, my entire miracle morning was laser focused on beating cancer and similar to the car accident, how quickly I rebounded and took my first step, the doctors were kind of amazed at how quickly my body was responding and, and healing. Do you have a guess on what, like, do you have a guess on what led to it or does it not really matter? I mean, what, what healed it? So they say they don't know. Um, I'm a big fan of 
uh, Jocko willing, right? Uh, yeah. Radical responsibility. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Extreme ownership. Extreme ownership. Yeah. Same thing. Um, and, uh, <laughs> that's like the Walmart version. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the equate brand. <laughs> radical responsibility. Um, I think there's another author, Bob Berg, I think talked about radical responsibility, but either way, um, for me, it's a hundred percent responsibility. It's a so. knockoff book. Yeah. That should be a thing. They just like knockoff books of the big ones. I mean, I was teaching it way yeah. before Jocko came along, dude. Um, this accident was 23 years ago. I've been talking about it since then, but, but, but I believe in taking a hundred percent responsibility, right? The, my, my, the way that I've said it for years, in fact, literally, this is in my book that I wrote in 2006, way before Jocko. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm harping on that. Um, Jocko, I love you. But, um, the, uh, but I, so my, my quote around it is the degree of responsibility that you accept for every aspect of your life is the degree of power you have to change or affect every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was like, um, I, what did I do? Like, what have I done that could have caused this cancer? Like when I asked the doctor that and they're like, they're, you didn't do anything. It's just random. It's just, I'm like, you don't know. Like, you don't know that. And so when I was uh, in my twenties, I took a lot of, I was single, I was vain. And I took a lot of workout supplements from GNC that had cancer causing dyes, red dye 40, blue dye 40, preservative. You know, dude, GNC is like a can like literally it's like, <laughs> Hey, what do you go to GNC? Like, I, I want to get cancer, so I'm going to go to GNC to start buying their products. Mm. GNC uh, is not one of my sponsors. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but so that's one possibility. I also looked at sleep in the original Miracle Morning book, and I apologize. Like, I, I was all about, like, mind over matter, so I would sleep five and a half hours a, a night. You know, now I'm, like, seven hours no matter what. I yeah. will not sleep less than that. But then I was like... I'm waking up at 4.30 or 3.30 a.m. I don't care what time I go to sleep, no matter what. I'm, I go to, go, out, go to bed at midnight, it doesn't matter, right? So I was, I was not getting enough sleep. Um, I also, I ate a pretty clean diet, which is interesting. We have to be cautious of the narratives that we tell ourselves. I'm, I'm healthy. I eat healthy. Hmm. No, you have to actually analyze everything. Because here's the thing. I was pretty healthy, but I ate a ton of sugar. I had a ton of sugar. Yeah. I had an organic vegan diet with vegan ice cream yep. and too much of it, right? It has all sorts of preservatives in it, you know? Um, so yeah, so I, I don't know, but I've just, I, I, I've looked at what might I have done. Oh, and I took Adderall. I took Adderall in my 20s. The pharmaceutical companies will never do a study on whether or not Adderall causes cancer nor any other pharmaceutical drug that they make money off of. Mm. Pretty Shocking. common sense, but yeah. we don't think about it, right? Yep. Um, but I, I, I honestly, I would, if I had to pick of all those options and, and the other ones I've evaluated, my guess would be Adderall. It's one molecule off of the street drug methamphetamine. It is a methamphetamine, Oof. right? So anyway, I, and I took that for probably 10 years or something leading up to cancer. And I stopped. I literally was taking it when I got cancer and then I stopped. Do you have a guess of which of the holistic practices helps healed you? Well, I'll tell you this. So um, I follow, uh, and this is a great resource. If anybody is wanting resources on, you know, beating cancer naturally, um, his name is Chris Wark. His website is Chris, C-H-R-I-S, ChrisBeatCancer.com. He was diagnosed with stage three or stage four cancer. And doctor said, if you don't do chemo, you will die. And he said, he prayed about it. He's very spiritual. He said, uh, I'm not doing chemo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this naturally. So he searched out the best holistic doctors and he ended up beating his cancer. And this was like 15 years ago. You know, see, he made it. He's, he made, he's alive. But he dedicated his life to interviewing all of these holistic oncologists and doctors to find out like, you know, and, 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 and other people that beat their cancer naturally and trying to assemble what's the best of the best. He said that of all the holistic protocols, so his answer to your question is coffee enemas. Mm. He said coffee enemas are... He said it's the most effective way, preventative measure to not get cancer. And if you have cancer, he said he believes, based on all the research he's done and the people he's interviewed, it's the most effective way to beat cancer. And for, for those of you listening, what a coffee enema is, yeah, you fill a, and go to, you can go to Amazon and buy a stainless steel coffee enema bucket and the kit and organic coffee enema coffee, get it all there. Um, and by the way, I love coffee enemas now. At first, it was super uncomfortable. And so what it is is, you, you basically, you, you brew this coffee um, and then you pour it into this uh, 32 ounce stainless steel bucket. It's a lot of ounces. And then there's a tube and there's a very pointy, soft, gentle tip. Uh, you put a little coconut oil on that and then you put that in your butt and you, I think it's your rectum is your technical term, right? Sure. Um, and, then, uh, and then you flip the switch and you absorb, you take all 32 ounces of the coffee up 
uh, and then you hold it in there for 12 minutes minimum. And what it's doing is it is stimulating bile production. I believe it's in your liver. Um, and that's where all of your toxins are stored that leak out into your bloodstream, that leak out into your organs, that turn into cancer. Um, and what it does is it the caffeine... It doesn't actually, you don't feel caffeinated at all. You don't, it doesn't, it doesn't absorb in your system in the same way. So you, you don't have the jitter. You could literally, you have no impact from the caffeine in terms of like, if you drank that much coffee, right? Um, but it stimulates bile production. And so it, it, it hyper detoxifies your body and get rid of all the accumulative toxins that can turn into not just cancer, but other diseases. So um, I did coffee in them as three times a week. Uh, and now I, and the first one, yeah, it was super, oh, it's, I'm so crampy. It's weird. It's awkward. Um, I now do them every Saturday and Sunday. And it's one of my favorite parts of the week, dude. It's meditative. I just, I literally meditate while I'm doing it. I love it. Fascinating, man. Yeah. I've never heard anybody talk about that. Ben Greenfield did a great article. If you, if you want to read about coffee enemas and go further into that, uh, uh, write, type in coffee enema, Ben Greenfield. He wrote a great article about that. That's what I usually send people to. And it's funny. I, I John Berghoff heard me give this little spiel about coffee enemas. He still does them now every single week, just preventative. He just does, He's like, dude, if it helped you beat cancer, I don't want to get cancer. So I'm going to do a coffee enema every week. And, he's, and he loves it. He, tell, he sends me selfies while he's doing it. It's, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one thing I struggle with a lot, and I'm curious your take on this. It's... It, so there are things that we know will probably increase your chance of getting cancer. There's a lot of things, right? Yeah. Drinking alcohol, I'm sure it does. Eating processed food, sugar, not exercising enough. There's all these things that, I, that lead towards cancer. Yeah. Or other forms of disease, death, whatever problems. Yet we still do them. And mm -hmm. it's, it's rare that we shake up our life and change everything until yeah. something bad happens. How can we get your mentality without going through the scare? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And you know, what just came to me, which I've never said before, but like to really get there, I think it's doing an exercise, right? Like, I think it's literally going, if I were to get cancer, what would that mean to me mm, my family. for me and my family yeah. and the people I love? Right. And then write it out. My kids being afraid of me, di me dying. That'd be number one, me dying, right? Me dying. That's number one, right? My kids, I mean, dude, my kids seeing me sickly. So I was 167 pounds when I got cancer. I got, within three weeks, I was 127 pounds. Shoot, wow. Um, chemo just sucked the life out of me. Not to mention, you know, I'm bald. I look sickly. I, you know, and I, and I was like, and, and then, the, the, then the, the crazy thing was like, dude, if I die, because I was like that for about a year. I was like, this is my kids. They're going to remember me as this. I was like, ah, oh, that sucks, man. You know, like, yeah. uh, so um, I think you got to get really clear um, as to what the consequences are. Get really present to that. Sit with that. Meditate on that, right? Kind of like for me to cry, right? I had yeah, to I really imagine my kids dying. I had to really get there and really go there and really sit with it and really meditate on it. And he'd feel what it would feel like if it was real, right? And that got me, I finally broke down. I found, so that would be my, my, that's the honest answer. And you know, you know, dude, take 10 minutes, right? If you do the miracle morning, take, make it your scribing practice tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but it's worth it, dude, because, and I don't know if the statistic is accurate. I actually believe this is more the pharmaceutical industry trying to program and seed by saying one out of three, you know, men will get cancer and one out of two women or vice versa. I don't know. It's one of those is the statistics. It's, you know, one of those two. Um, I don't know if that's true or if that's, they, that's how they be, that's how they make all their money. Yeah. Right. And by the way, the side effects of the chemo that I was on, this is probably true for almost all chemos. Literally, I was reading the side of the bag one day and it's like, can cause leukemia. Oh, geez. I'm like, wait a minute. I have leukemia and the medicine air quotes medicine you're giving me cause can cause leukemia. Right, and that's why, by the way, people get repeat cancers and or die from the, the you know the drug. But, um, but anyway, um, so that would be it. Get really present to it, and then from there, um, you know, do do a little bit of, of research. I'm wondering. I'm sure there are books on how to prevent cancer. That'd be an interesting piece. But for me, the way I live now is the way I should have lived then. Yeah. The way I lived then was the narrative. I'm healthier than most people. 
So that's good enough. Versus what am I putting in my body that could cause cancer? And am I okay with the consequences that I wrote out? I never did that exercise or I would have made these changes ahead of time. Yeah. And I think you have to really take that seriously because again, whether the, the, the pharmaceutical industry's predictions are right and it's one out of three, it's still a lot. Almost everybody knows somebody that's been affected by cancer, right? Are you willing to take that risk? And if not for you, right? It's real easy to go, eh, do you have a family? Do you have kids? Do you have parents? And how would they feel if you died? And are you willing to take that risk? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's a no, but we live in that we don't, we don't, we, we feel invincible until we're not. We feel invincible. Like, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Right. And the other problem I, I, I talk about this in Miracle Morning is I call this isolating incidents. It's one of the main causes to me of mediocrity in our lives. Isolating incidents means that we, we look at everything as a one off. Ah, I can drink this today. I, it's just one. I can eat this today. I can, I can smoke this. It's, I can, yeah. I'll do it today. Right. I can, I can sleep in today. But it's never today. It's who you become. Every decision that you make, it's not about that one incident. It doesn't affect that one day. This is who you're becoming. Every time you hit the snooze button, you're becoming less disciplined to get out of bed in the morning. Every time you eat crappy food, you're becoming more conditioned and okay with eating crappy food. That's where really being thoughtful and impeccable with your decisions, and here's the beauty of it. When you live, you know, when you eat healthy most of the time, have your cheat day, right? And it feels good when I eat unhealthy. Like, and it's usually le- maybe one meal a week that I'll just be like, whatever, dude, right? Oh, I, lo- I, I feel zero guilt because I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. I eat healthy 98% of the time, right? Yeah, I love that. Last question on the cancer thing. Hmm. Uh, and then we'll move on to kind of the wrapping up questions. But yeah. what did that do to your... Uh, belief slash faith, whatever in in a god or God, mm. I don't know where you're where you land yeah. on that. But what did that do to that in that period? Yeah, uh, so I have a very strong faith. Um, I don't. I'm not so much religious uh, in that. And here's the distinction I would make. I was talking to a friend actually on the way here about this. That same friend I was telling that you're on a pedestal because you're a god to <laughs> me. <laughs> we're, we're, both, <laughs> we're both pedestal hugging. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, I wish we were on stools. Yeah, that would be better. There are some over there if we want to stand on that later. <laughs> um, no, but I told him, I was talking to him about church and about religion. And I said, you know, I said, I'll give you an example. Like I go to a Christian church and I, I believe in Christianity and I follow most of the principles and right. Um, but I also believe that I, 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 I look at the whole picture and here's what I mean. My um, father-in-law uh, and his, his, uh, his wife, they go to a, it's called the, it's a, it's the self-realization fellowship. Uh, I don't know if that's a chain and there's a bunch of them or, you know, or right. Uh, or if it's just the one they go to in San Diego, but, um, they, they follow teachings from Christianity, from Judaism, from Buddhism. Uh, and I'm, and, and I don't know a bunch more. And to me, I think there's something like 3000 religions. Um, and that's my thought is uh, to me, it, I, I don't see why it would make sense to ignore you know, to just go, I'm only going to learn one tradition. I'm only going to learn one set of beliefs. To me, I want to learn something from everybody, you know? And to me, it's about your relationship with whatever you got, you know, God was God, right? And I I call, I call God, him, her, I don't know, right? Like I, I call that, that source, that universal source of energy and love God. Um, but, uh, Oh, I said something important to say about it. Um, Give me a second. Um, oh, to me, religion is um, man and it's human beings uh, trying to make sense of it, of, of what that is. Um, and to me, I'll even connect science and religion and go, you know, the, the, like quantum physics has proven that there is a universal field of energy that all things are born from and die into. Sounds a lot like God to me, yeah. right? So so for me, uh, and, and my, my real answer is, I don't know. Like, I have a very strong conviction that there is a God, but I I couldn't give you all the details. I couldn't tell you, no, this is exactly who he is and what he believes and what he says and what you can do and what you can't do. And this is, this one religion is right and the other 2,999 are wrong. And if you, if you don't believe in mine, you're going to hell. And like, uh, so, you know, and, and by the way, I respect everyone's beliefs. So I actually, I, in fact, I said this the other day, I was talking about, I think I was talking to my wife about it, about, you know, religion. And I said, um, my, 
uh, you know, honestly, a question that I would ask around it is, is it useful, right? Meaning if you believe in a specific religion and you don't condemn other people, I think it's an important piece of it. Like, you know, like for, if you, for me, there's some hypo, it's a little hypocritical to go, you know, God is love and loves all people, but not if you, but if you disobey, then you burn for in hell in sure. eternity. It's like, well, if God is like the ultimate parent, I don't know what parent would be like, well, kid, you disobeyed me, so you're going to spend your eternity yeah. burning in hell. Like, right? So, I, so, so those are some things that just that I, that I, yeah, that's a hard, yeah. that's a hard truth to accept. And, and as a Christian, you know, as well, I, yeah. I look at that, I'm like, I see that in the Bible, like the idea, you know, like Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but yeah. through me, right? So I was like, okay, Jesus is saying he's the way there. But I also see I'm a parent, and even if my kid was a jerk, I don't want my kid to punish forever, right? Yeah. So then I really, I've reconciled that with C.S. Lewis has a great quote. He mm. says, if hell is locked, it's locked from the inside, uh, meaning that they've, if, if there is a hell, like if, if hell yeah. exists the way that we Christians believe it generally does, yeah. and it's an eternal punishment, it's because they're choosing forever to stay there and not go to heaven. Mm. And I like, I, I reconcile it. Now, somebody's probably calling me a hit, you know, or whatever, uh, 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 what's it called? A blasphemer. Blasphemy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I reckon, like, I'm okay. I can, I can be okay. I can, A, I can be, I like that explanation, but I'm also, and I feel like you're here too, and you, I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm okay not knowing. I'm yeah. okay with the mi- going, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I know that it kind of says this, and I know I believe in God. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to be perfectly okay with that dissonance and say, oh, it's okay because it's beyond me. I can't yeah. figure it out. But if God exists the way that I think he does, I think he can handle whatever that is later on. And so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to worry about the things that yeah. I can control. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts? I'm actually really curious on um, the... You said, you said, you know, God, I think God can handle it. So like the, we're like being a jealous God. Yeah. Like to me, I heard somebody say once, like, I know humans that have gotten over their jealousy issues. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I'm like, it, you know, so, so like, so there's, there's some specifics that I, I have, I have trouble reconciling sure. like that. That's yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm no theologian anyway. Yeah. Right. But when I look at the jealousy thing, I, I, would, I believe you are a theologian. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That beard uh, says otherwise. Yes. I am a, I'm a desert father. <laughs> um, no, I look at the jealousy thing as not so much like I, I don't like that you're looking at her and I therefore am angry. It's an internal like, this is a deficiency in me, therefore I'm angry. I yeah. look at the God's jealousy more as him saying, look, like this is the right way to do it. Like that gives you cancer. This doesn't. Hmm. What the hell are you doing over there? Like yeah. that's the, this form of like, I'm not jealous as an internal thing. I'm mm. jealous that you're giving your attention to that and that is killing you, mm. right? So the same way you might say, and again, I may be if totally making this up. If your kid were to do something, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. jealous that my kid is focused on their iPad all day instead of me. It's yeah. not an, it's not a, yeah, sinful, I get what you're right? saying. I love yeah, that. I, I, you I, are a freaking theologian, dude. Look at this. Dude. All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna yeah. go with that. Yeah, and 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 in things like that, there are a lot of things that don't make sense in, that to me in the Bible, right? Yeah, I can yeah. justify, and I've heard a million things. There's yeah. things that just don't make sense, and I'm just like, I'm okay not knowing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's my that's my my religion yeah. is I love God. I believe in God. I literally talk yeah. to Him every day. Um, and uh, and yeah, and it's funny. I, I didn't fully answer your question. Um, but with the cancer piece, how did it impact that? Um, I think I, I don't I don't know that it did much at all. Meaning I have unwavering faith uh, in God, um, and uh, if anything, I guess it did strengthen for sure. It's like just another. There you are again, God. Like there you are. You and and, and I will say this: I've done um, some really deep uh, meditation sessions um, where God, uh, I got the message that Hal, um, I've put you through the car accident, the financial crash, the cancer, like all of this is so that you can serve, because I really do believe like uh, my life is dedicated to service. I have lots of selfish wants Mm -hmm. and desires, we all do, but I, I, I believe I was put on this earth to endure these things, to learn from these mentors that I was blessed to have in my life that taught me the five minute rule and you know, things along these lines. Um, that Jim Rohn taught me the, you know, that quote that led to the miracle morning, right? And that I'm supposed to go through these and, and maybe it's true for all of us, right? That we're supposed to take our, cause again, my mom and dad did it with their loss of their child. Take, just, just basically go through life and try to be the best version of ourselves, fulfill our potential, overcome adversity, which is part of fulfilling our potential, and then turn around and help as many people as we possibly can 
with what we've learned, right? And I'm not saying anything that hasn't been said, a, you know, a, a infinite amount of times. But, um, but, but yeah, for me, I've gotten that message from God that like, because, because here's the thing is I've been put through these horrific experiences, the cancer, the car accident, especially. Um, but I always had everything I needed to get through them. I had the right mm. people, the resources, the support, the love, and I feel like that is God. Um, I also feel like my sister dying, you know, I have this, a narrative that she's an angel up there and she's kind of looking over me, you know, I'm not exact. And again, I don't know. I just, yeah. it's an interesting thought. And, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, man. You know, I'll, uh, I'll wrap with this quick story. I think I may have told you this before, but my mother-in-law got, uh, well, my wife's, you know, my wife's mom yeah. got, um, I'll say I can get through the story without crying. Mm. Uh, my, uh, wife's mother was diagnosed with cancer back when my, uh, when my wife was 16 mm. and she, uh, was given, I think it was like a year, maybe six months to live. It wasn't, it was a bad mm. cancer. Uh, and my wife decided to postpone going to college. Uh, she was like getting ready to go to college. She was homeschooled. She got done a little early. was going to go to college. Decided to wait to spend that last year with her mom. Mm. So her mom did very similar to you. I mean, they, she did some chemo, but she also went strict, like mm. vegan, raw, like the whole thing. I mean, they were nice. really holistic stuff. Cancer went away, healed the cancer, which was, again, she wasn't expected to, survived. Uh, still here today. My wife decided oh, to wow. delay going to school by one year and she went the next year instead. The year that, that I went to school, right? Like the, the year that I went there. So I met Heather and Rosie and Wilder are alive today because of cancer. Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing to think like, we don't always, we hardly ever see the reason why things happen. And maybe there's more reason than that. Yeah. But Rosie and Wilder would not be alive today. My kids wouldn't be here yeah. if it weren't for cancer. Yeah. And like, Again, we rarely see that, but I try to always take that thought of like, why did this happen to me when anything goes wrong, right? Like, yep. and when we, when we, we get glimpses occasionally, like, oh, maybe that's why. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. So thank God for cancer in that case. And well, I, you, to you, what, what that brings up for me is that, so there's, you know, the old adage, everything happens for a reason, mm-hmm. right? You'll see, you know, <laughs> really- we usually don't see. Yeah. But um, I think that where people get, get tripped up with that yeah. is that we um, we're looking for the reason or we're asking God in this victim mentality. Yeah. Why, why, yeah. why versus I believe everything happens for a reason, but it's our responsibility to choose the reason. Yeah. Mm. And we can either choose reasons that disempower us and make us miserable or reasons that empower us and move us forward. And either are true. It's whichever you pick. Yeah. Right. Bad things always happen to me. That's a reason. Yep. I'm supposed to learn from this, grow from this, and help others. That's a reason. That's a reason. They're both equally true. Yep. It's whatever you decide. You're in control. One of my favorite quotes is, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes that reason is because you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that. Because like, yeah, people do stupid things. They're like, I don't know why this happens to me. I'm like, because you're yeah, yeah, drinking yeah, yeah, yeah. and driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you got a DUI, because you're a moron. You know that. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. We're going to wrap this thing up with the last few questions. I ask them every time, but I'm going to make this a fire round. Yeah. Uh, three. That's your passive aggressive way of saying yeah, how you yeah. <laughs> No, it's my way of thinking, I don't know if these cards are going to hold out long <laughs> enough. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Uh, these three, uh, three, Is it my bedtime? it's getting close, man. <laughs> uh, three, uh, tangible things you've done in the last 12 months that has given you a better life. Could be lessons learned, things you bought, people you met, le- you know, oh, you should have you prepped changed. me for these. I, I know. Uh, right there. Yeah. There's three things you've done that have made your life better recently. In the last 12 months. Yeah. Just things you've improved your life. by doing. Um, I moved to a, a, a ranch. My okay. wife and I moved out of the city and moved on to land. And that's been incredible. We have 25 chickens, two sheep, three mm. turkeys, two dogs, a big turtle, tortoise. Um, so living on the land. Tortoise is really- power. We always talk about tortoise power, like tortoise oh. and the hair. Oh, yeah. So I always say like tortoise power. I want to get t-shirts made that say tortoise power nice. with like the Ninja Turtles. But anyway, yeah. tortoises. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so, dude, is this your first interview? You don't interrupt like that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, moving on the ranch has been really, really, really nice. Um, uh, what else? Uh, deciding to update the Miracle Morning. Mm. Um, the... I've always wanted to do an updated and expanded edition because when I was writing the book, Tim Ferriss had the four hour work week and then like two hour, two years later, the, the updated and expanded edition came out. And so uh, I've been working on the Miracle Morning update and expanded edition for six months. Um, and uh, it's the first time it'll ever be, I, I finally decided to sign with a traditional publisher. The Miracle Morning sold 3 million copies self-published mostly. Shoot, uh, it's traditionally published in 37 other countries, but in the US it's still self-published. Um, and so uh, that edition will come out probably in, seven months from now. So that's really exciting. Um, that's a big one. Um, and, uh, I got to finally redo the book. And then, um, the third one, 
Uh, oh, I finally decided to be more social. I'm very antisocial. I'm a total introvert. I don't <laughs> like going out with friends. I don't like... Really? If I have the choice between eating by myself, being by myself, or being with another human... I mean, I'm talking to my kids and wife, which is like, like I love being by myself. And so this year I realized, and I, I and for me, my friendships, like I don't have to see them. I don't have to see you ever. And I feel the way about you that I felt the last, it doesn't matter. Right. But I don't think everybody's that way maybe. And so I decided this year I was going to start doing friendship Fridays mm. and, uh, and investing. And, and it's either me spending time with friends. It's me being more social, getting out of my comfort zone, going to social events. And that has been remarkable. And it's amazing that as I do it, it's easier to be social. And I actually enjoy it more because I now realize the payout, the payoff, the payoff that I was missing. So, yeah. That's, that's cool, man. It's yeah. funny. I, I was just telling, I think, Justin Donald that I only see you about once a year. Yeah. Randomly at some event, we were like running each other. Yeah. And we're always just like, we pick up right where we were before. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah. we're friends. And then, totally. And then we don't see each other for another year. And it's like, oh, yeah, hey, yeah. what's up? All right. That's how I feel. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm similar to you. I can just, yeah, I yeah. can avoid it. All right. Three, uh, what I call pivot books. So a book that you were reading and then your life took a pivot because of the book. So what are three pivot books in Ooh, your life? I love that frame, pivot book. Mm. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. Book Yourself Solid by Michael Port because that's the book I read when I did my first, when I, when I started the Miracle Morning and I was like, I need coaching clients. I bought the book Book Yourself Solid by Michael Port and using the strategies in that book, that's how I went from, uh, you know, not enough coach guys to pay the bills to doubling the clients in two months. Um, that was a big one. Um, the Millionaire Fast Lane. Oh, I love that book. Yeah, MJ DeMarco really shifted how I thought about money. And it's so funny. It's like this It's like this kind of cheesy uh-huh. title and cheesy cover. Yep. And like. And I, I love him. I've had MJ on the podcast. He's great. Have you? Would you introduce me? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, Sin- like he's literally on my, my yeah, yeah, he's on my list. Um, Stetson. Yeah. And MJ Marco. MJ's okay. chill. He's a cool yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, and then, you know what I just realized? I actually, I want to erase those and give you three other ones. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'll, but I'll give them to you in rapid fire. Okay. Um, Michael Singer, either of his books, yeah, uh, The yeah. Untethered Soul, Love and then it. his new book, Living Untethered. Yep. That was a game changer. Um, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. Have you read that? No. That was a, a very much, he asked God every question that, all the things that you read the Bible, you're like, I don't get that. Or that doesn't make sense. Like you said, there's a yeah. lot of things. He asked everyone to God. And then God allegedly gave him answers. And while that feels like blasphemy or it feels like, anyway, <laughs> um, it's, and, and part of it, he goes, how, how would I know this is you? He's like, well, why do you think I would have stopped talking to human beings 2,000 mm. years ago? You think that I only talk, like, yeah. I mean, so there's basically, here's the thing. Is it useful? All the questions he asked God, when you get the answers back, they're very useful. And you go, oh, that makes more sense than anything I've ever heard on the topic. Yeah. Now, to be fair, I was 20 when I read that book. If I read it now, I don't know if I'd view it the same. But keep in mind, he sold 10 million copies of that book. Oh, <laughs> so there must be something in there, right? Um, so that's one. And then um, uh, the other one is Byron Katie, Loving What Is. Have you read no, that? No, I'm not. Loving What Is. Phenomenal. Um, yeah. And, uh, I love getting book recommendations. I love them. Yeah. yeah Untethered the Soul made a big impact on my life. I've read that a few times. Yeah. I always love it. Yeah. Beautiful, man. All right. Last question for you. Where can people follow you, find you, stock you, et cetera? That's buy the your easiest stuff. question. It is the easiest answer. question. It's a softball. Um, MiracleMorning.com is the hub. Uh, and, and by the way, I've never really loved my websites. I'm always like, uh, like I have different sites. I, our homepage, it makes me so happy. It's so beautiful. It's so like, they did such a good job. Anyway, so MiracleMorning.com. Uh, when you go there, um, I think like right under the first fold is the Miracle Morning movie. You can watch the documentary for free. Keep scrolling the app. You can download the app for free. Keep scrolling all of the books. And there's 14 books in the series. The Miracle Morning for real estate agents, for college students, for parents and families. David Osborne did Miracle Morning Millionaires. Um, the books are all there. They're not free. You got to buy them. Um, but uh, And you can join the Miracle Morning community, which is a Facebook group with 350,000 organically so, like I've never marketed it. It's just, they read the book, they join the group and it's one of the most supportive, engaged online communities that I've ever seen. So miraclemorning.com and you can access all the social from there uh, as well. I love it, man. Hal, you're the best. Thank you for the world's longest podcast episode. I, love I know, it. dude. Thank you. I, was, I, I thought I was on Joe Rogan for a minute. <laughs> I love it, man. <laughs>